بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد This will be a recording of the commentary on the text of Imam Al-Akhdari in prayer and purification. We begin this recording on the, on the 19th day of Rabi' al-Awwal, the day that our Prophet Muhammad ﷺ was given his name. He was born on the, on the 12th day and given his name on this, the 19th day of Rabi' al-Awwal. And in the history of the Muslims, they celebrated both the 12th day, his birthday, and the 19th day of Rabi' al-Awwal, the day that he was given the name. We hope that this recording will benefit others in practicing the sunnah and implementing the Qur'an properly. And this is our way of paying our respects to our noble messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The author of this text is the great scholar Abdul Rahman ibn Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Amir al-Akhdari. He is a scholar from the area that is now known as Algeria. He was born in the year of Hijra 918 and he died in the year 983. He was a famous scholar and a master of Arabic, of poetry, of logic, rhetoric, the subtle meanings of Arabic, and a great faqih, a jurist of the Islamic law. He was known for his deep hatred of innovations and wrote text refuting some of the innovations that had been taken as practices throughout the Muslim lands. He wrote a number of texts regarding fiqh, the, akhda, the mukhtasar of al-akhdari. He wrote a text on purification of the heart. He also wrote texts on logic and num numerous other texts. And his texts have been accepted throughout the past 500 years by both scholars and students alike. The students have studied his text and the scholars have written commentaries on the text. And the scholars have mentioned that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to show acceptance of a servant, he will accept them through his other servants. And the scholars also mentioned that it may be that his wide acceptance of his work be because of his sincerity and also his, his love for the sunnah and his hatred of innovations. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this action sincere in gaining his pleasure and in wanting to revive the sunnah of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we hope to be from amongst the people that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Whoever gives life to one of my traditions, one of my sunan, it's as if he has given life to me. And whoever has given life to me will be with me in Jannah. The text starts out by saying, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin khatim al-Nabiyyina wa imam al-Mursaleen awwalu ma yajibu ala al-Mukallafi tasheehu imanihi. The author, Rahimahullah, Imam Al-Akhdari, begins by saying, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. He begins by saying, Praise be to Allah. Because of the hadith, the Prophet, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that every matter of importance that does not begin with the Bismillah, by saying of bism the saying of Bismillah, and the saying of Alhamdulillah is cut off. And what he means by cut off, he means cut off from Barakah. And it's not a total cutting off from barakah, but it means that it, that action will be deficient in barakah. So it has been a tradition of the Muslims and actually recommended that all people beginning letters or beginning text or beginning anything that they want the barakah to descend in, to have blessings in, that they begin by saying Bismillah and then also Alhamdulillah. So Alhamdulillah, praise be to Allah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Praise be to Allah, the Lord of creation. The Rabb in Arabic is the one that nurtures something. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our nurturer, our Lord. Al-alameen is the plural of alam with a fatha on the lam. You have in Arabic the alam with a fatha on the lam and the alim with the kasra on the lam. The alim is the one that knows. The alam with the fatha on the lam is the created thing. And the plural of that is alameen. So by saying Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, you're saying praise be to Allah, the Lord of all creation. Then the author says, Was salatu was salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad. He says, Prayers and peace be upon our Master Muhammad. And the prayers is a request from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
to give mercy to, to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and to raise him in his rank, in his degree. And the salam, the peace, is asking that he be protected from all disliked things. Be upon our Master Muhammad, Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Khatim al Nabiyina, he is the seal of the Prophets. Anybody that believes that there is a Prophet after him is a kafir, has left Islam. Wa Imam al Mursaleen, and he is the leader of those who have been sent. And this has a dual meaning. The first is the general meaning, which is that he is the Imam of the Messengers. He is their leader in a general sense. And in a specific sense, on the night of the night journey, Laylat al Isra wal Mi'raj, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was taken from Mecca to Jerusalem and there he led the messengers in prayer before he ascended to the heavens. And so because of that he has been given the title Imam al Mursaleen. He led them in prayer and he was their Imam. So he is the Imam of the messengers, the leader of those who have been sent. Awwalu ma yajibu ala al tasheehu imanihi. Imam al Akhdari then mentions that the first obligation incumbent upon one legally responsible is the rectification of his iman. The first thing that a person has to do once he's a mukallaf, a per person who is re legally responsible, is the rectification of his iman. The mukallaf, the legally responsible, is the person that has come of age, has attained puberty, and also has intellect. So if a person has, um, is a, uh, ha does not have any mental deficiencies, and he is now physically an adult, and that is known by, in the, uh, for both the male and the female, the ejaculation of fluid or the growing of coarse hair on the pubic area or for the female menstruation or pregnancies. These are the physical signs that a person is now an adult. If he also has an intellect, and that intellect means that if he were to be spoken to, he could respond properly, then this person by sharia is an adult. Everything that is haram, he must stay away from, and everything that is wajib, he must do. This is the mukallaf, the one legally responsible. If none of those signs, the physical signs show up, then once that person reaches 18 lunar years of age, then he's considered legally responsible. Before his age of responsibility, before the taklif, he is not taken into account for anything that he does in regards to the prohibited matters. This mukallaf, the first thing that's obligatory upon him once he reaches that age of legal responsibility is tasheehu imanihi, is that he rectifies his iman, that he makes sure that his creed, his aqidah is in accordance with the Quran and Sunnah. And that's that he knows what's necessary for Allah, meaning that Allah is everlasting, he has uh, begin, um, firstness without beginning. These are necessary for Allah. Then he also knows the things that are impossible for Allah, such as coming into creation. And then he knows the things that are permissible for Allah, in that he can bring things into creation or he could take them out. And this is a whole science that Imam al akhdari in this text does not specifically mention, but there are other texts that do discuss it. So it is incumbent for a person to make sure that his aqidah is in accordance with the Qur'an and Sunnah by knowing Allah and knowing the messengers, knowing what's incumbent for them, what's prohibited for them, and what's permissible in their right. And then also knowing about the Qur'an and knowing about the last day and knowing about the uh, ordainment. This is the tasheeh of his iman. The author then goes on to say, ثُمَّ مَعْرِفَةُ مَا يُصْلِحُ بِهِ فَرْضَ عَيْنِهِ كَأَحْكَامِ الصَّلَاةِ وَالطَّهَارَةِ وَالصِّيَامِ Imam Al-Akhdari rahimahullah then mentions, after knowing what is incumbent upon him, as far as his iman, then he must have knowledge of what makes sound his individual, individual obligations, his fard ayn, such as the rules pertaining to prayer, purification, and fasting. These are all the rules that he has to know for himself. And this is where the ulama differentiate between fardain and fard kifaya. Fardain are things that every single legally responsible Muslim has to know and has to perform. He can't 
assign this task to somebody else. Examples are prayer. You cannot have somebody else pray for you. Fasting. You cannot have somebody else fast for you. You must fast yourself. There are other things that are fard kifaya, such as praying upon the dead. As long as a certain portion of the community fulfill that obligation, then the rest of the community do not have to do that. And that is the fard kifaya, the collective obligation. So once the legally responsible person knows his iman and has rectified his iman, then he has to know what makes sound his individual obligations, his fard ain. And the fard ain are all the rules uh, pertaining to the five pillars, prayer, purification, fasting, hajj, zakat. And then also knowing the halal and the haram. He has to know either by studying what is halal and what is haram or by asking. And if he's going to get married, he has to know the rules of marriage. If he's going to buy and sell, he has to know the rules of buying and selling. If he wants to hire people, he has to know the rules. All of these things have been mentioned either directly in the Qur'an or by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or have been uh, taught to us by the scholars from their understanding of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So his fard ain includes numerous things. But this text is specifically talking about prayer and purification and also purification of the heart. The author then says, وَيَجِبُ عَلَيْهِ أَنْ يُحَافِ اللَّهِ عَلَىٰ حُدُودِ اللَّهِ وَيَقِفَ عِنْدَ أَمْرِهِ وَنَهِيهِ also incumbent upon one legally responsible is being vigilant concerning the prescribed limits of Allah, fulfilling His command and avoiding His prohibitions. This is known as the hudud of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set down certain limits, the hudud, and we are prohibited from crossing them. So the person has to know that. He has to make sure that whatever is prohibited, he leaves, and whatever is an obligation, he does it. And again, the only way that a person would know the limits of Allah, would know the prescribed limits of Allah, the hudud of Allah, is either by studying or by asking the scholars. وَيَقِفَ عِنْدَ أَمْرِهِ وَنَهِهِ And he fulfills his commands and avoids his prohibitions. وَيَتُوبَ إِلَى اللَّهِ سُبْحَانَهُ قَبْلَا أَنْ يَسْخَطَ عَلَيْهِ If for any reason a person has transgressed the prescribed limits of Allah, then he must repent to Allah. So the author says, he must also repent to Allah, exalted beyond description, before he incurs his wrath. So the one legally responsible, if he does something that's haram, he has to immediately realize that he should turn back to Allah and do tawbah. And now the author gives the conditions of repentance. وَشُرُوطُ التَّوْبَةِ النَّدَمُ عَلَى مَا فَاتَ وَالنِّيَّةُ أَنْ لَا يَعُودَ إِلَىٰ ذَنْبٍ فِي مَا بَقِيَ مِنْ عُمِرِهِ وَأَنْ يَتْرُكَ الْمَعْصِيَةَ فِي سَاعَتِهَا إِنْ كَانَ مُتَلَبِّسًا بِهَا The first one, النَّدَمُ عَلَى مَا فَاتَ He has to have remorse for what has transpired. If a person is no longer doing this wrong action, he has stopped it. His stopping must be because he's, he's, uh, he has remorse for doing that action. Whereas if a person stops it for other reasons, then he has not fulfilled this condition of repentance. So for example, if a person is drinking, and then he stops drinking because it's bad for his health, then he is not remorseful for what he has done. He must be remorseful, his heart must be broken. They said, in kisarul qalb, that it has to have, his heart must be uh, hurt for what he has done. That's remorse. And then, وَالنِّيَّةُ وَلَّا يَعُودَ إِلَىٰ ذَنْبٍ فِي مَا بَقِيَ مِنْ عُمُرِهِ there must be an intention never to return to the wrong as long uh, the, the wrong action as long as he lives he must have the intention that he stops it now and he'll never go back to it again whereas if a person is remorseful for this wrong action that he did today but he knows that he's going to go back to it tomorrow then he has not fulfilled this condition of repentance so it is not a correct toba it is not a correct repent also in the, about the second condition if the person for whatever reason has remorse and never and does not have an intention to go back to has an intention never to return to this and then for whatever reason he becomes weakened and he goes back to that thing that does not negate the original repentance he must now make repentance for this new action but that first repentance is still valid وَأَن يَتْرُكَ الْمَعْصِيَةَ فِي سَاعَتِهَا إِن كَانَ مُتَلَبِّسًا بِهَا 
He must also leave the disobedient action immediately if engaged in it at the time of repentance. So if a person is actually engaged in this action, of, uh, in this prohibited action, then one of the conditions for him is that he must leave it immediately. And it's not permissible for him to delay it. So if a person is in the midst of committing a wrong action, and he feels remorse, and he knows he's never, he doesn't want to go back to it again in the future, but right now he's going to complete it, then he is not, he's not doing Tawbah. Even though he feels remorseful, this is not considered Tawbah. And, وَلَا يَحِلُّ لَهُ أَنْ يُؤَخِّرَ التوبة. It is not permissible for him to delay repentance. So if he's doing this thing right now, and he's delaying repentance, then he's now doing another wrong action. So he has to do repentance for the initial wrong action, and then he has to do repentance for delaying the repentance. And then if he delays that, then he has to do repentance for delaying the repentance, for delaying the wrong, uh, uh, delaying stopping the action. And so it could actually accumulate. وَلَا يَقُولَ حَتَّى يَهْدِيَنِ اللَّهُ فَإِنَّهُ مِنْ عَلَامَةِ الشَّقَاءِ وَالْخُذْلَانِ وَطَمْسِ الْبَصِيرَةِ Nor should he say, I'll wait until Allah guides me. For that is one of the signs of wretchedness, forsakenness, and spiritual blindness. This is something that many people that are delaying Toba, this is something they say, I'll wait until Allah guides me. Or I'll wait until I'm 40 and then I'll start praying. Or for young women, they say, I'll wait until I'm an old woman and then I'll start wearing hijab. Or I'll start working on my deen once I become old. This person is waiting for Allah to guide him and he, should, he said he should be very careful. He should not say this first of all because it's a mockery of the deen. And he should also know that if he is saying that, or if somebody else is saying that, then it's a sign of three things. الشقائي والخذلاني وطمس البصيرتي It's a sign of wretchedness, shaqa, which is the opposite of sa'ada. Shaqa is that a person, a'udhu billah, dies on other than Islam. He dies a wretched person. Because true wretchedness is that a person leaves this dunya without iman in his heart. So if a person is saying this, I'll wait for Allah to guide me, guide me then it could be a sign that he's going to die in kufr. A'udhu billah. Also, khudlan, forsakenness or abandonment. And this abandonment happens in, the, in this dunya and in the akhirah. It's a sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has abandoned this person in this world by not giving him tawfiq. Tawfiq is divine success. And tawfiq is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives person the ability to fulfill the commands. And this is tawfiq. So if a person is fulfilling the commands of Allah, it's not by anything that he's doing himself. It's that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed him to to, to fulfill the obligations and to uh, stay away from the prohibitions. This is tawfiq. The opposite of that is khudlan, abandonment. If a person is doing prohibited actions, it's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has abandoned him by not giving him tawfiq in that or those matters. So if a person is saying this, I'll wait for Allah to guide me, it's a sign that he's been abandoned or forsaken in this dunya. Also, a'udhu billah, it's a sign that he will be forsaken in the akhirah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He's spreading out His mercy on the day that, we, that we're in most need of His mercy, on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, the day of judgment, He will abandon that person. al basirati, And also spiritual blindness. Basirati in Arabic is the seeing with the heart, the spiritual sight. Basar is seeing with the eye. So when a person goes to sleep and has a dream, he's seeing things. But it's not with his eye, it's with his heart. And that's the basira, the, 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 the heart's eye, or the spiritual sight. So if a person is saying this, it's a sign that that sight of the heart is blinded, spiritual blindness. The author, rahimahullah, then says, وَيَجِبُ عَلَيْهِ حِفْظُ لِسَانِهِ مِنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ وَالْكَلَامِ الْقَبِيحِ وَأَيْمَانِ الطَّلَاقِ وَانْتِهَالِ الْمُسْلِمِ وَإِهَانَتِهِ وَسَبِّهِ وَتَخْوِيفِهِ فِي غَيْرِ حَقٍ شَرْعِي He says, Then it is also an obligation upon one legally responsible to guard his tongue from foulness, evil and unpleasant speech, or to swear by divorce, humiliate, insult or curse a Muslim, or to threaten him with anything unless it involves an obligation concerning the sacred law. So it is an also an obligation upon the legally responsible one, the mukallaf, to guard his tongue from foulness, evil, and unpleasant speech. And this is defined as anything that a person would not say in, in the presence of dignified company. So this includes many things. First and foremost, 
uh, cursing, bad language. Also talking about things or joking about things that you wouldn't do in the presence of dignified company. Talking about matters of the restroom. Talking about matters of um, relationships between uh, men and women. Talking them in a, in a, um, in a way that's not dignified. And the Arabs, in their language, they were very modest in the way that they referred to these things. So, for example, they say in Arabic, um, if a person is going to use the restroom, they say, قَضَى الْحَاجَةِ Taking care of a need. They don't explicitly refer to that matter. And even in other cultures, they, they use terms that don't um, explicitly refer to the matter that's going to be done. And so if a person explicitly refers to it, then it's considered undignified. So the idea is understood, but it's not explicitly stated. So to maintain a sense of modesty and a sense of dignity. So if a person goes uh, uh, discusses it in a way that's undignified or uses bad language, this is foul, evil, and unpleasant speech. And this includes numerous things. And Imam al-Akhdari mentions some in the, in the, uh, in the next uh, few lines. And there are also texts that go into this in uh, deeper. Uh, one of them is Maharam al-Lisan, the text by Muhammad Mawlud, specifically about prohibitions of the tongue. Everything that is prohibited to say, he mentions it in a very abridged text that is studied um, in, in Mauritania up until this present day. Also, وَأَيْمَانِ الطَّلَاقِ It's incumbent for the legally responsible one to not swear by divorce. Swearing by divorce is a habit that the Arabs had and still have today other cultures don't necessarily have them, but it's that a person swears, um, uh, swears, but instead of swearing by Allah, saying by Allah, he swears by divorce. So he says, if such and such does not happen tomorrow, my wife is divorced. Or he invites somebody and he says, come to my house and if you don't come, my wife is divorced. Or he gets mad at somebody and he swears, this, he, he, he swears about something and uses divorce. So it's haram for a person to do, to swear by divorce, but if he goes ahead and does it, and the thing is not fulfilled, like he says, I will do such and such, or my wife is divorced. If he does not fulfill that promise, that's what he swore, uh, that oath, then his wife is divorced. So it's haram for him to do that, but it is nonetheless binding. When tihad al muslimi it's also incum uh, incumbent upon him to, to not humiliate another Muslim, or to insult him, or to curse him in any way. So to uh, humiliate him, or mock him, or say things about him, or to write about him, or to talk about him in, other, in, in his absence, to do anything um, to a Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ said that if a person says, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, if he says that there is no uh, deity except for Allah, and that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah وسلم, then one of the things that has become pro, uh, uh, pro, uh, incumbent upon the Muslims to uh, respect is his dignity and his honor and his, and his person. It's also incumbent to stay away from scaring another Muslim unless he has a right ordained by the sacred law, by the Sharia. So to scare a Muslim, even if it's in jest, is haram. So to scare him in any way, to scare him if he ha if he d if a person does not like this Muslim and he's scaring him just for the just for the uh, um, just to scare him and to make him feel bad, then that's haram. Or he's just doing it as a joke. This person is not his enemy. This person he doesn't have any hatred towards, but he just he just does something to scare him. He stands behind the door and jumps out. That was specifically mentioned by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi that it's prohibited for a Muslim to scare another Muslim, even if it's in jest, or even if it's done to a little child. ويجب عليه حفظ بصره من النظر إلى الحرام ولا يحل له أن ينظر إلى مسلم بنظرة تؤذيه إلا أن يكون فاسقا فيجب هجرانه It is also incumbent upon the one legally responsible to safeguard his gaze from looking at anything prohibited. Likewise, it is not permissible to look at another Muslim in a contemptuous way unless he was a deviant person and then it is an obligation to avoid him. So he says, Imam al-Akhdari rahimahullah, it is an incumbent to safeguard his gate from looking at anything that's prohibited. So anything that's prohibited, such as looking at um, a member of the opposite sex in a uh, lustful way, or looking at them if they're not properly covered, or also looking at anybody that's doing a prohibited action. The general principle is that if something is haram to do or say, then it's haram to look at or haram to hear it. So if a person is doing a haram action, 
it's incumbent upon the Muslim to lower his gaze. So when it says in the Quran that the believers, they lower their gaze, it's not just from uncovered uh, uh, members of the opposite sex, it's also from people that are doing haram things. وَلَا يَحِلُّ لَهُ أَنْ يَنْظُرَ إِلَى مُسْلِمٍ بِنَظْرَةٍ تُؤْذِيهِ It is also not permissible for him to look at another Muslim in a contemptuous way. So to look at another Muslim in a way that he wouldn't like, like staring at him if he doesn't like it, or looking at him in a, in a mean way, any way that that Muslim that's being looked at would not like it, then this is haram. Also the other nazar, there's two kinds of nazars. In Arabic it says yanzura, look. There's a nazar with the eye, and there's a nazar with the heart. So to look at him in a contemptuous way with the eye, outwardly, is haram. And also to look at him inwardly with the heart, in a contemptuous way is haram. And that looking with the heart is dwelling upon his faults, or thinking about the faults of another Muslim, and um, uh, gaining pleasure from that. that he's, or even if he does not gain pleasure from that, to just dwell upon and think about the faults of another Muslim, is looking at him, in a contemptuous way. So if that Muslim were to hear or see what that uh, Muslim is thinking about him, he wouldn't like it. So for that, it, it becomes prohibited. Unless he was a deviant person, and then it is an obligation to avoid him. Unless he was a deviant person, this in Arabic is the fasiq. The fasiq, or the deviant, or the rebellious Muslim, is defined as a person who does one of the enormities, or he does one of the sagha'ir, one of the lesser sins, on a regular basis, all the sins that are, that are that are prohibit uh, things that are prohibited are either it's either a normity, a grand sin, or a lesser sin, a sagira. So it's either a kabira, a grand sin, or a sagira. If a person does a kab uh, kabair, uh, examples of those are are, are zina, theft, and uh, and numerous other ones, and then also the 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 sagair, lesser sins. If a person does that on a regular basis, then that lesser sin becomes a kabira. And so this person that's doing that, that's doing the kabira, or he's doing the sagira on a regular basis, he becomes a fasiq. His hukum is that he's a fasiq. So if this Muslim is a fasiq, then it becomes incumbent to avoid him. And this is in hopes that by avoiding him and sort of excommunicating him, it'll bring him back. And he's also going to discuss this more in detail, Imam al-Akhdari, later on in the text. So this Muslim, if he's doing a, a haram act, act, and he's a deviant Muslim, then it does not become, um, it is not haram to scare him. Or it's not haram to look, uh, to look at him in a contemptuous way if it's directly related to that prohibited matter that he's engaged in. So for example, if a person's doing something haram and a Muslim can't, uh, he can't talk to him, he's not listening to him, so he can scare him. He says, if you don't, if you don't do this, we're, I'm going to take you to the authorities and scare him in a way that will, in hopes that he'll stop that wrong action. Or he looks at him in a in contemptuous way out of disgust for the state that he's in. So then that, that in that case, it would be permissible. But... To look at him in a contemptuous way always, or to scare him in everything, that's not, uh, that's not what the, the sharia is mentioning. It's only in things related specifically to the wrong deed that he's doing. And this is if we, um, um, he's going to talk about uh, enjoining, righteousness, enjoining righteousness and forbidding evil. Later on in the text, and, and it'll um, clarify uh, this a little bit, by um, clarify the dealings that we have with the fasiq, with the deviant Muslims. ويجب عليه حفظ جميع جوارحه ما استطاع وأن يحب لله ويبغض له ويرضى له ويغضب له ويأمر بالمعروف وينهى عن المنكر. Also incumbent upon him is protecting all parts of his body to the best of his ability. He should love for the sake of Allah and hate for his sake. He should be pleased for what for his sake and be angered for his sake. He should enjoin what is good and forbid what is evil. So it is incumbent upon the one legally responsible to protect all parts of his body to the best of his ability. So the parts of the body, the eyes, the ears, the tongue, the hands, the stomach, the genitals, and the feet, these parts of the body, the seven limbs, these seven limbs are what are called in Arabic the jawarih. The jawarih is the plural of jarih. Jarih literally means something that wounds, a wound, um, uh, that, that, that makes wounds. And so the same name that is given to limbs is given to predatory animals, a jarih. The jawarih, these limbs, 
And the reason it's called this is because they, 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 they wound. People wound people with their tongues. They wound them by looking at them. They wound them by walking to the haram. You can wound yourself, you can wound others with these limbs. So these jawarih must be protected. Now the author says in the text that he must protect his body to the best of his ability. And this is also taken from an ayah in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that to fear Allah to the best of your ability. And some people have a misunderstanding of this. And what it means by the best of his ability is that he tries his best. He does all that is within his ability to protect his limbs from the haram. But if something haram comes in, then that's not, he's not taken to account for that. So for example, if a person tries his best not to eat the haram, he makes sure that he, he looks at all the food he eats, he looks at, at his source, he looks at what is made from, he makes sure that it's a halal, but then in one, one day he accidentally eats something that's haram. So for this person, that haram that went into his stomach was, outside, was, was, uh, was out of his ability. So for that, that haram that went into his stomach, he's not taken to account for it. So that's what it means by to the best of his ability. Or if a person is walking in the streets and he's lowering, lowering his gaze from the haram, from the, uh, from the women that are um, not properly covered, from the people that are doing haram actions. But even in lowering his gaze, something's coming in. Sometimes he might accidentally look up and see something. That is, he's not taken to account for that because that's not um, within his ability to stop. So he, he, he feared Allah to the best of his ability, made sure to keep his gaze lowered, made sure to, um, to not eat the haram and so forth. But then even with all that trying, some of the haram came in. So he's not taken to account for that. Some people think that to the best of his ability, that they can fear Allah for a portion of the day, and then they say, oh, the rest of this is out of my ability. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying that he expends all, his, uh, all that he can to prevent the haram from coming to him, but if something comes and he's not uh, able to stop it, then he's not taken to account for that. Then the author says, وَأَنْ يُحِبَّ لِلَّهِ وَيَبْغَضَ لَهُ then he should also love for the sake of Allah. So for the believer, his love is based on what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. He doesn't base his love or the things that he loves based on what the people love or what his culture loves or what he himself, his nafs loves. No, he looks to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has shown love for and then he also has love for that. So Allah has shown love to the prophets. That he loves the prophets. So for us, we have to love the prophets. If people have hate for the prophets, then that's kufr. That's disbelief. He has, he has shown love for the believers. So it's incumbent upon every single mu'min, every single believer, to love the believers. He has shown love for knowledge and for the people of knowledge, the scholars. So for every believer, they have to love knowledge and they have to love the scholars. So anything that Allah has shown love for, he has to also have love for that thing. And if he shows hate for something that Allah loves, then it could take him out of Islam. Also, he has to hate what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates. And in the same way that he loves for what Allah loves, and he bases his love on what Allah has shown love for, he bases his hate not on his own personal uh, feelings or on his country's feelings or on his, um, um, uh, the people, his people's feelings. He, base it on, he bases his hate on what Allah has shown hate for and what the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam has ho showed hate for. So he hates disbelief. The believer must hate disbelief because Allah has shown hate for disbelief. And he hates the people who hate the prophets. And he hates wrong actions. So everything that is, has Allah has shown hate for, then it is incumbent upon a believer to show hate for that thing. Also, وَيَرْضَى لَهُ وَيَغْضَبَ لَهُ he should do things that please Allah. He should make sure the believer that in his daily actions and his uh, his speech, in his in his word and in his deed, everything he does or says is um, he is doing it to try to gain the pleasure of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala and to gain the pleasure and the acceptance of the messengers of Allah, alayhim um, salam. And then also it's incumbent upon the responsible one, the mukallaf, to be angered for his sake. So the believer does not get angered for his own, uh, because of his own personal feelings. He gets angered for the sake of Allah. If there's something, if there's a um, a wrong action, 
and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered us to change those wrong actions, the only way that you can change them is if you have hate for that thing, and then if you feel anger enough to change that thing. Or if the believers have to be protected, if they're being oppressed and a person has to protect them. The only way he can do that, that he can motivate himself, is to have anger enough to move him. So this, um, uh, we have to analyze this with the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said um, to the man that asked him, he said, counsel me. And he said, don't be angry. La taghdab. And then he repeated it three times. And what that means is that he was telling him, don't be angry, meaning don't don't uh, have blameworthy angry. Because we know that if a person does not have any anger at all, then he's not going to have the ability to change haram. Because he's not going to f have feelings of anger towards this thing. He's not going to be able to protect his people, the believers or the oppressed, if, the, if an oppressor comes in. So if a person totally removes anger from his heart, all anger, then it becomes incumbent upon him to uh, bring back some of that anger. The anger that would allow him to um, uh, be angry towards the things that Allah is angry with. So here where it's saying that he should be angry for Allah, angry for Allah's sake, he's angry in the things that Allah that would anger Allah. And he's going to talk later in the text uh, about the blameworthy anger. Uh, the blameworthy anger, and that's the anger that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told a man to not have. Then he says, وَيَأْمُرَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَا عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ also incumbent upon the one that's legally responsible is to enjoin righteousness and to forbid what is evil. And the interesting thing about the way the Arabic states righteousness or good and then evil or sin is ma'ruf and munkar. So in English it's translated as enjoining what's uh, good and forbidding what is evil. Good in Arabic is khair and evil is shar. So in Arabic it does not say uh, no, it says Ma'ruf in Arabic literally means that which is known. So the reason good is called Ma'ruf is because the heart knows it. The heart knows good. Good things are, um, are familiar to the heart. Evil things have to be uh, taught to the heart because the heart does not know that which is evil. So when it says munkar, munkar literally means that which is unknown. And uh, evil, because it's unknown to the heart, and the heart has to be taught evil. We don't have the idea of original sin, or that ch children are inherently evil. Um, they have to be taught that, because their hearts are pure, and their hearts only know that which is good. So the only way that they're doing, they're, they're, uh, they're, getting, um, they're doing bad things, is that be, th th they're being taught it. Either by the either by the humans or by the shayateen. Now, the majority of people do not know the conditions of enjoining righteousness and forbidding be, uh, forbidding evil. So you get two extremes. You get some people that totally leave it, and they don't do any enjoining of righteousness and any forbidding of evil. And then you have other people that do too much of it because they don't know the conditions of it. So for the one that is legally responsible. And the one that has to enjoin righteousness and forbid evil, he has to know what are the conditions. And the conditions of enjoining righteousness and forbidding evil are three. The first one is knowledge. The person that is enjoining righteousness or forbidding evil has to know what is the hukum of this thing. What is the judgment of this thing? Have the scholars um, gain consensus about this thing being prohibited or this thing being an obligation. And if they have not, then it's not an obligation and sometimes and it's not permissible to enjoin righteousness if a person uh if there's a difference of opinion if there's a valid difference of opinion about this thing and that person that you see doing it you know that he's following that other opinion that opinion of the scholar then it's in then it's forbidden for you to uh, to uh, to 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 do amr bil ma'ruf an nahi 'anil munkar anhu you can give him advice. You can say, you know, there's a difference of opinion about this. The safest thing is to leave it totally. But you can't go to him in an um, angry way and say, this is haram. So you have to have knowledge about this thing. Um, if, there is, if the person is doing it and he's not aware of that opinion, so he's actually doing it and he doesn't know the opinion, or he only knows of the haram opinion, then you tell him this is haram. Or if a person is following an opinion but it is extremely weak, 
It is a shad opinion or it's a la'if opinion. It's a weak opinion. You have to tell him that it's not permissible for you to be following um, uh, the dispensations in the deen. You can't be taking rukhsas and you have to order him to not do that. So the this the first condition is to have knowledge about that thing. If a person does not have knowledge about that thing, then it's haram for him to enjoin righteousness and forbid evil. Because it may turn out that he's actually enjoining something that is haram. He's telling people, do this, and it's actually haram to do, because he does not know the hukum. Or he's forbidding something, and it's actually wajib, it's actually an obligation, or it's actually permissible. So he's now changing the sharia. So for that reason, a person that is going to embark on enjoining righteousness and forbidding evil has to have knowledge. And this knowledge comes through either studying the text of religious law or asking the scholars. So if a person goes and enjoins righteousness and forbids evil without knowledge, he himself is actually now doing a haram, a prohibited act. The second condition of enjoining righteousness and forbidding evil is that he knows that um, his telling this person to do this or to not do this will not lead to a greater harm. So if the person has a, has a weapon, say for example he has a gun or a knife, and he's doing something haram, and a believer would come to him and say, don't do this, and he knows that uh, he's, going to, he's going to hurt him or hurt other people, then it becomes haram for him to enjoin righteousness or forbid evil in that situation because now it's going to lead to a greater harm. So before actually doing this, enjoining the righteousness or leaving, uh, forbidding the evil, you have to know that it will not lead to a greater harm. The third condition is that you believe that this enjoining or this forbidding will actually benefit the person. If you know that if you tell him this is haram, he'll stop, or if you tell him this is wajib, he'll do it, then it's then it's incumbent for you to do that. But if you don't think that he's going to listen to what you say, he's going to um, he's going to mock you for what you're doing. He's not going to care. He's not even going to listen to what you're doing. So there's no benefit. Then it is not incumbent upon you to enjoin righteousness and forbid evil. So if this the third condition is not there, then it's. Um, it's not incumbent for you to enjoin the righteousness and forbid the evil. And then there's a difference up among the scholars. Is it permissible or is it recommended? But in uh, uh, no opinion is it an, ob uh, an obligation. Then the author says, وَيَحْرُمُ عَلَيْهِ الْكَذِبُ وَالْغِيبَةُ وَالنَّمِيمَةُ Also prohibited for him is lying, kadib backbiting, ghiba, and dissembling words or carrying tales, namima. Lying is mentioning something that's not true. And a person could either do this knowingly or unknowingly. So what he's talking about here is lying knowingly. A person knows that this thing is not true and he, he mentions it. And the prohibition can actually vary in degrees based on what he's lying. If he's actually going, he's intending to take somebody's right or to cheat them or to harm them, then it's extremely haram. And, uh, and and so on. If uh, if a person, whereas if a person mentions something and he doesn't know that what he's mentioning is not true, but he mentions it unknowingly, then it is actually considered kedib. It's lying, but he's not taking to account for that. Unless he's mentioning every single thing he hears and he's not he's not um, uh, leaving out some of the things that he thinks might be doubtful. Or if he mentions a thing uh, and he's not sure about whether it's uh, true or not, he should say, I think, or I don't, I'm not sure. Something that would allow the listener to, um, to know that this person is not sure. Whereas if he's mentioning everything he hears as being true, then he's going to um, um, have some lies come into, his, um, um, in, into what he's reporting. So that's kedibo. Intentional or knowing lying is haram. Ghiba backbiting and riba is defined as mentioning something about your brother in his absence that if he were to hear it he wouldn't like it so riba is actually mentioning something that's true about him a fault about your brother or um, that that he's actually there's something either a physical fault or a um, um, something in his uh, in his in his character something in his body, something in his clothes, something about his family, something about his people, anything. They said even mentioning something about his dog 
If he would not like to hear that, and you mention that in his absence, then it's considered riba. Now, if you mention it in his presence, that's something else. And it's also haram because it's harming another Muslim. But it's not considered riba because it's done in his uh, because it, that was done in his presence. So riba is mentioning something about him in his absence, and it's something true. Whereas if a person is making up lies and saying him, uh, saying them about about that person either to his face or in his absence, that's also haram, uh, but it has a different name. This what he's mentioning here is riba. It's one of the worst sins for a Muslim to do, and Allah mentions in the Quran that it's like eating the flesh of your dead brother. And the reason Allah used that, that uh, the person was eating the flesh of the dead brother, because they said if a person goes and eats the flesh of, a dead, of his dead brother, the, that, that, that person, the dead, has no ability to protect himself. So if you're mentioning something ab about a person in his absence, you're not giving him a chance to defend himself. Just like that person that's eating the flesh of the dead is not giving the dead a chance to protect himself from being uh, dishonored. And then Namima which namima is carrying tales or dissembling words. So if person A backbites person B, and he's backbiting person B in the presence of person C, person A is talking about B, and he's talking about him to person C. So person A did, ba did riba, backbiting of person B, and then when person C took this story to person B and said, do you know what so-and-so said about you? This person, person C, is doing namima. He's carrying tales, and it's actually worse than riba because it in, it, it uh, increases the problem, and it harms not only the person that was backbitten, but also the backbiter himself. Because the reason he did it in the absence was that he didn't want it to be known. So now you're harming him by causing uh, him grief and by causing him problems that are going to uh, happen. And many communities are are um, uh, are torn apart by this by this namima. So it's one of the worst sins. Um, and it's uh, explicitly stated in the Quran um, where Allah says Hamaz uh, mashaim binamim and that he's a Hamaz and that he's a person that, that, that carries tales so this is haram and it's incumbent upon the person um, the incumbent per the, the, the responsible person to not do this and to prohibit somebody if they're doing it and if it's being done in their presence and they're not able to change it then they have to leave that area then the author rahimahullah says والكبر والعجب والرياء والسمعة والحسد والبغض ورؤية الفضل على الغير والهمز واللمز والعبث والسخرية والزنا والنظر إلى الأجنبية والتلذذ بكلامها وأكل أموال الناس بغير طيب نفس والأكل بالشفاعة أو بالدين وتأخير الصلاة عن أوقاتها. The author, رحمه الله, says prohibited for him is pride, vanity, religious showing off, religious bragging, envy, hate. Deeming oneself superior to others, fault finding, exposing faults, idleness, mockery, illicit sex, looking lustfully upon non related females, deriving pleasure from a woman's voice, devouring the property of people without their consent, living from worldly intercessions or displayed righteousness, and delaying the prayer past its prescribed times. Prohibited for him is pride, which is in Arabic kibir. So it's a person thinking that he's actually better than others because of knowledge, or beauty, or wealth, or whatever it may be, he's thinking that he's better than others. This, the disease of kibr, is prohibited. And this and the other diseases of the heart that Imam al-Akhdari is now mentioning, he's just briefly going over them, and there are texts specifically related to this science, the science of diseases of the heart, analyzing the heart, seeing the diseases, identifying the diseases, diseases of the heart, um, looking at their root causes, looking at the symptoms, how to tell what, what, which disease is what, and then looking at the cures for them. This is the science of the disease of the heart, and um, it can be done through a number of texts. The text that's studied in Mauritania is a text by Muhammad Mawlud called The Purification of the Heart, Matharatul Qulub. So he's saying it's prohibited for him to have kibir, also to have ujub um, uh, or vanity. And the ujub is that a person... Uh, looks at the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him and forgets that they're from Allah. So ujub actually doesn't need a second person um, to, uh, to so that this person can do this um, d um, thing too. Kibir or pr uh, pride or arrogance, the person looks at this blessing that Allah has given him and is arrogant over another person. Whereas ujub or vanity 
is that the person looks at the blessing and he forgets that it's from Allah's blessing and he thinks that he's actually has a part in doing this and having in, in, in this this being um, this being given to him forgetting that it's, it's strictly from Allah by the bounty of Allah so the ujub even if a person is by himself he might have this disease whereas kibir arrogance can only be done if he has a person to be arrogant over the next disease he mentions is riya which is religious showing off and is specific to showing off in, in religious matters uh, showing off in other matters if they're related to the dunya he's going to um, he doesn't mention that but that's fakhr or uh, boast, uh, boasting or showing off and it might cause arrogance but here he's talking about religious showing off which is uh, defined as iqa'u qurbatin li ghayr al doing an act of worship for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake so a person stands up and sees other people and wants them to see him pray so he goes ahead and performs a, pr pr a prayer just so they see it or he recites Quran or he studies or he teaches or he's an imam solely for the sake of other people so this is riya it's performing that act of worship for other than Allah's sake the next disease is sum'ah it's also incumbent upon him to remove sum'a from uh, from his heart, and sum'a is that he he does an action of worship solely for Allah. Initially, he did it, and he was sincere in doing it for the sake of Allah. But then later on, he began mentioning it to people. So that's religious bragging, and he's mentioning it to them um, to 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 lift himself up. He's not mentioning it to mention the blessings of Allah. Some of the righteous people and some of the Sahaba would mention the blessings that Allah had been had given them. They would say, uh, I'm able to perform the prayers at night, the tahajjud, I'm able to fast, so and so. And they're mentioning these things only to mention the blessings of Allah. And they're not doing it um, to try to tell the people that, here, look what I've done by myself. No, they're mentioning it, saying that Allah has given me tawfiq to do it. He has allowed me to do it. But I, I, I'm not doing it myself. Whereas the person that's religious, uh, that's doing religious bragging, sum'a, he's doing it, thinking that he actually has the the he's the one that's doing it. So the sum'a wipes out the reward of that action. So he initially received reward for that action, but because he began bragging about it. He wipes out the reward. If he does toba, if he does proper repentance from that from that action, he can he can re, re, uh, regain the reward of that action. Whereas the previous disease that was mentioned, riya, the, there was no um, uh, or religious showing off. There was no reward to be established in the first place. So he has to do repentance from doing that riya. But he does not gain any re reward for that action because the action was never done sincerely for Allah. The next disease that he mentions is hasad, or envy. And it's that a person sees a blessing in another person. And he, he hates the fact that he has that. And he knows that if he had the ability to remove the blessing from that person, he would do so. So that's hasad. And it has to be removed from the heart. And it's one of the worst diseases. And it causes many other um, the, the person to do many haram actions. And these, all these diseases, um, uh, begin, uh, they are in the heart, but they'll show up on the limbs. They'll cause people to they'll cause people to to do the haram. So we previously were going over the prohibitions of the tongue. The tongue is one of the limbs. The only way a person can lie about somebody, backbite them, or do anything is if they have a disease in the heart causing them causing their limbs to be able to do this. Because we know that the heart, if it is sound, the whole body is sound. And if it is if if the heart is corrupt, then the whole body is corrupt. So if these diseases are present in the heart then that corruption will show up on the limbs in the forms of lying, backbiting, carrying tales, mockery of people, and so on and so forth. It's also incumbent for him to remove bold from his heart, hate. And this is the blameworthy hate, the hate that Allah has not approved of. We previously mentioned in the text that he has to love and hate for the sake of Allah. And here he's saying hate is haram. What he's mean, what he's saying here, hate or bold, if it's the blameworthy hate, if he's hating things that Allah does not hate, he's hating things that Allah loves. So it's it's incumbent for him to remove hate from his heart if he's hating for other than the sake of Allah. وَرُؤْيَةُ fadli عَلَى الْغَيْرِ Also deeming himself superior to others. 
He has to remove this from his heart. وَالْهَمْزُ وَالْلَمْزُ And then fault finding or exposing faults. And this in Arabic is the hams and the lems. The exposing faults with the tongue we mentioned was ghiba. The exposing faults in this manner of the hams and the lems is done with the eye, with winking or with nudging or with pointing. So if a person is doing something and and he would not like people to see him doing that, and he's trying to do it in secret, and then somebody uh, kind of nudges somebody and says, hey, look at that guy, and points, or doesn't say anything, but points to him, or kind of um, winks, like the, what the kuffar would do about the believers. When they would walk by, they would wink at each other and, and, and kind of say, like, hey, look at them, or, or um, and, and do it in a, in, a, in a state of mockery. So this is the hems and the lems. Some of the scholars say that hems is with the eye, and lems is with the hand. Some say that it's the opposite, and some say that they both mean the same thing, that they're that the hems and the lems is with the eye, fault finding with the eye, with winking, or with pointing. So this is also haram. abathu, And that's doing something that does not benefit them in the dunya or the akhirah. Vain play. Like the Quran says that the dunya is just sports and amusement. So they're just doing things that do not benefit them in the dunya or in the akhirah. So these things are haram. sukhriya, Also mockery. Mocking another Muslim. Like was previously mentioned, ihanatihi. So um, mocking another Muslim is haram. And he has to stop and make tawbah for doing it. Was zina. The zina here is translated as illicit sex. And it has that meaning, specific meaning. But zina is also um, also um, done by other limbs. It's not, do- not just done by the genitals. There's zina uh, or adultery that can be done by the eyes. The Prophet ﷺ says that zina was written on the son of Adam and he's going to get it. He's going to, they're going to perform it. And, and all the limbs do zina, the seven limbs. The eyes do zina and their zina is looking at the haram. The tongue does zina and, zina, and its zina is talking about the haram or kissing unla- um, uh, women that haven't been made halal f- uh, to him through marriage. The hands do zina and their zina is touching. The ears do zina and their zina is um, uh, listening to the women. The feet do zina and their zina is walking to the haram. The heart does zina and its zina and its uh, adultery is reflecting upon doing the haram with a woman. So all these forms and then the genitals which is adultery. So all these forms of zina it's incumbent for the believer to protect himself from. وَنَظَرُوا إِلَى الْأَجْنَبِيَّةِ Looking at an ajnabiya. Ajnabiya is a woman that's not that's not related to him and it's not and is and he's not married to her so this woman it's prohibited for him to look at her if she's not properly covered meaning if she if uh, the only thing that you can look upon for a man of a woman is her face and her hands and this is if he's looking at them without any pleasure so if he looks upon anything other than the face and the hands with or without pleasure that's haram because he's looking upon a ajnabiyya or he looks upon any part of her body, her face or her hands, or even her covered parts with pleasure, then this is lustfully looking at a non-related female. And the ajnabiyya is the non-related female that's not married to him. And the mahram, his woman that's related to him, his sister, his mother, his daughters, his aunts, his grandmothers, and so forth, he's, it's permissible for him to look at her face, her hair, her arms, her feet, he, he, she, they do not have to wear their hijab in front, uh, in front of them. And then also for the woman, it's prohibited for her to to look at a man lustfully. Then he also says deriving pleasure from a woman's voice. So it's prohibited for the incumbent one to derive pleasure from a woman's voice. And this if it's um, a pleasure in, in uh, actually like a sexual pleasure, or even just he likes talking to them and there's no benefit. It's permissible for a man and a woman to engage in, in business dealings or um, in, um, in, in social um, uh, dealings as long as there's proper conduct. The man is properly covered, the woman is properly covered, there's no touching, they're in a the room, they're not by themselves, and he, uh, she's, uh, he's only looking at her face and he's dropping his gaze. He can't, even if it's permissible to look at her face, he cannot keep a constant gaze at her face. He has to constantly be dropping his gaze so as not to keep a constant gaze at the woman. So if he, um, if 
if those things are not done, and there's and there's um, uh, one of the things that can be um, that is not con that is considered um, improper conduct between a man and a woman is just talking about things that have no benefit. Meaning, if it's not if it's not a business dealing or something important, um, a social uh, matter or so forth, they're just chit chatting or flirting. Then this is uh, deriving pleasure from a woman's voice. It's not necessarily um, sexual pleasure, but he just likes to talk to a woman. He likes to chat with a woman. So this is not permissible. It's not permissible for men and women that aren't related to just chat or just flirt or just talk about things. They have to make sure that they're talking about something that the Sharia has allowed them to talk about, and they're doing it in a way that the Sharia has allowed them to do it. It's also prohibited to devour the property of people without their consent. And this specifically is not talking about theft. Theft is def definitely haram. This is talking about devouring the wealth of pre people without their consent. So it's not really theft because this person went to somebody and he asked him for something or he, um, he kind of coerced them into giving him, giving him this thing. So the person that gave up the wealth, gave it up willingly, it, so it wasn't forcefully taken from him or it wasn't stolen from him without his knowledge. But he gave it up. But the person, the way he got it was that he, he, um, he did it in a way that the person did not like. So a person came to him and just, had, and just kept bo bothering him and badgering him. Give me this thing. Give me this thing. And the person doesn't want to give it up. But eventually he gives it up because he's tired of this person. He wants to get rid of this person. So he gives it up. So it's not theft. The person didn't take it, um, steal it, but he took it without the person's feeling good about it. So that's prohibited for a person to do. Or there's some people that um, that it's known that they can harm them in either talking about them, spreading tales about them, or saying things about them. And so people give them money just to, just to keep them quiet, just to keep them satisfied so that they won't harm them, either physically or verbally or so forth. So that person, he's taking that thing, um, he's not stealing it, but he's taking it without the person giving it, he's not feeling good about giving it. So that's haram for him to, uh, to accept. بالشفاعتي, also, it's haram to live from worldly intercession. Worldly intercession here is shafa'a, and it's that if a person has the ability, either because of wealth or because of prestige, to stop the oppression of a, of a, of an, of, of a person, then it, um, and and he goes and he takes and he goes to that person. He said, "Hey, look, I stopped this from from coming to you, so it, so so um, uh, he's expecting something, some monetary benefit, because if if a if a believer has either prestige, standing within the community, or he has wealth, and he has the ability to stop oppression of a Muslim, he steps in and he intercedes for this Muslim. He stops a government wants to take his land, and he steps in and he, and he stops the government from taking his land. Somebody wants to physically harm a Muslim, he steps in because he has physical or, or financial ability to stop this person from being oppressed. He has to do that. It's incumbent upon the believers to protect the the the, the weak believers. But then he goes to that uh, person he protected, and he now expects some monetary benefit. That's haram. That's living from worldly intercession because it was incumbent for him to do that to to offer that protection. And now he's it's, he's accepting, um, he's expecting um, some monetary benefit for that uh, protection that he gave. So it's haram for him to do that. If the person that was protected willingly gives a gift, then that's something different. But he's accepting a um, he's expecting some uh, some benefit for that protection that he's given. Then displayed righteousness is also haram. That the person is actually doing something from the deen to benefit uh, um, himself from this world. So he goes and he, he becomes an imam of a masjid or he prays or he becomes a hafiz of the Quran or he recites Quran or he teaches or he studies only to benefit uh, from the dunya because he knows that people will give them money. Or he knows that within the Baytul Mad, within the Muslim treasury, treasury, there's salaries for these positions, and he's doing that solely for gaining that that um, that that benefit. Then now he's living from displayed righteousness, and that's haram. Whereas if a person does that solely for Allah, and just as a matter of fact, that person can get uh, money from the community to support him for doing that, for teaching, for being the uh, for being the muaddin, for being the imam, then he can accept those things. But to do it solely for gaining that dunya is haram. And in another 
um, narration of this of this text it says wal aklu biddini uh, with a fatha on the dal this is aklu biddini with a kasra on the dal with a shadda which is displayed right uh, with it, which is um, displayed righteousness and then aklu biddini uh, which is living from um, from uh, from debt and what that means is that a muslim if another muslim wants to borrow mo money it's not incumbent upon him to loan him the money, but if he does that, he can only do it for the sake of Allah. He cannot derive any benefit from that loan. So we cannot expect that, 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 the, um, that the one who um, takes the money pays him more than what he gave him. And that's a riba, that's interest, and, and it's not permissible. So he cannot accept anything extra than what he gave him. Or during the co course of uh, the, uh, the debt, while the debt is still owed to him, he cannot accept gifts from him or he cannot um, uh, ask that person to do something that in normal circumstances he would not allow him to do, but because he has a debt with him, he allows him to do it. So, for example, he has a, um, he has a car, he wouldn't lend it to this person normally, but because he owes him money, he feels indebted to him, so he loans him the car. So the person cannot accept those things, those uh, um, uh, extra return on the, on the money or gifts or um, services while the debt is owed to him. وَتَأْخِيرُ الصَّلَاةِ عَنَ وَقَاتِهَا And then also dis delaying the prayer past its prescribed times. Um, to delay the prayer without a, with, without a valid reason is, is haram. And it's one of the worst sins and he's going to discuss it later. And the prayer time will be discussed when, it's, um, uh, when it begins and when it, when it ends, when's the pre preferred time and when's the uh, necessary time in the section of um, the prayer. وَلَا يَحِلُّ لَهُ الصُّحْبَةُ فَاسِقٍ وَلَا مُجَارَسَتُهُ لِغَيْرِ ضَرُورَةٍ وَلَا يَطْلُبُ رِضَ الْمَخْلُوقِينَ بِسُخْتِ الْخَالِقِ Also prohibited is the company of a deviant person or a fasiq. So it's not permissible to keep the company of a, um, of a fasiq. And that was defined as a person that does the, the kaba'ir, the enormities, the greater sins, uh, or he does the sara'ir, the lesser sins, constantly. And he has not done tawbah from them. So this person, the fasiq, the person that does any of the haram things that was mentioned here or any other things, people that listen to music, people that engage in the haram, people that deal with women in an improper manner, people that uh, shave their beards, women that do not wear the hijab, these are all examples of fisq. And if a person is engaged in it constantly, then he becomes a fasiq. So for this person, it's not considered, it's not permissible for him to keep the company. He cannot be his friend because a true friend can only be a person that is uh, implement, implementing the sunnah and help you in doing that. So if a person is not doing that, if he's outwardly rebellious or inwardly rebellious, he shows the diseases of the heart, that he has those diseases, diseases he's a fasiq, and it's not permissible to keep his company. Not only to, uh, it's not permissible to take him as a um, friend, but you can't even um, sit in the presence of this person unless there's a barura. Unless there's a necessity. Some of those necessities would include things such as calling this person to Islam. If you believe that, that you're going to be able to guide this person to Islam or guide this fasiq to make tawbah, then you can sit with him and you can be with him with the intention not of taking him as a friend, but the intention of bringing him back to the correct way. Or if a person has family members that are not implementing the um, uh, implementing Islam or they're not Muslims. So these, person, these people have fisq. They have deviance. The Muslims have deviance or fisq and the non-Muslims have kufr. And they have to, uh, both uh, categories have to make tawbah from their, um, from their um, disobedience. So if they're family members, you can sit in their presence to maintain kinship bonds. Um, especially if you think that you're going to be able to bring them back to the truth. But if a person does not have a necessity to sit with these people, then it's not permissible to keep his company and he has to remove himself from that presence. Or if he believes that he can teach them something, he's teaching them, or um, um, then he can um, sit in their presence. But he cannot take from a deviant person, he cannot study from, a, he can teach a fasiq, but he cannot study with, a, uh, he cannot take a fasiq as his teacher and he's going to mention that, Imam al-Aqdari will mention that in a, in a few lines. ولا يطلب رضا المخلوقين رضا المخلوقين بسخط الخالق قال الله سبحانه وتعالى والله ورسوله أحق أن يرضوه إن كانوا مؤمنين وقال عليه الصلاة والسلام لا طاعة لمخلوق في معصية الخالق One should not seek the pleasure of creatures in what displeases the Creator. 
Allah the Exalted says, and Allah and His Messenger are more worthy of of pleasing if they were truly believers. And the Messenger وسلم, says, there is no obedience towards a creature in that which is disobedience towards a creator. So a person should not seek the pleasure of creatures in what disple- displeases the uh, creator. If the if the creatures, if people want him to do something, or he doesn't want to do something because he it would displease the 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 creature uh, the, the 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 creation the people. But at the same time, uh, by pleasing the creation, he displeases Allah. Then that's haram for him to do, and he's and he's making a mockery and he's showing where his where his uh, allegiance is. He's showing that his allegiance and his loyalty is to these people, to his uh, standing within the community, to his uh, to 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 what people think about him, and he's not caring about what Allah uh, thinks or what the messenger thinks, and that's why the author then mentions. The ayah where Allah the Exalted says, And Allah and His Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, are more worthy of pleasing if they were truly believers. So if, if the people were truly believers, they would look to pleasing Allah and pleasing the Messenger, even if it displeases the creation. And they would not um, uh, think about um, um, pleasing the creation if it would cause any displeasure to Allah and His Messenger in any of the matters of His life. And the scholars have also said, if a person occupies himself and be and is concerned with pleasing Allah and pleasing his messenger then eventually Allah will put the uh, um, uh, uh, will make people love him and respect him whereas if a person preoccupies himself with trying to please and gain the respect of people and at the same time gaining uh, he's he's gaining the displeasure of Allah, displeasure of Allah and his messenger then Allah will put uh, displeasure in the hearts of the people so he will not win their hearts. The only way to win the hearts and to gain to the respects of the people is to um, do things that would um, seek to do things to seek the pleasure of Allah and of His Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, said, "There is no obedience towards toward a creature in that which is disobedience towards a creator. That we only obey um, the people. You only obey your parents. You only obey, obey the Imam, the Khalifa." If there's no disobedience to the uh, to the Creator, to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, so if somebody says don't pray, and Allah says to pray, then you have to dis- disobey the creation and obey the Creator, and the same goes for any of the other orders. If it if it is in accordance, if uh, the person is giving you an order that does not go against Allah and His Messenger, then you can listen to him. But if he if he is giving you an order telling you to do something or expecting you to do something, and it goes against the order of Allah. Then he has to remember the principle that the loss, uh, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave us, and that's that there is no obedience to, toward a creature, and that which is disobedience toward the Creator. ولا يحل له أن يفعل فعلا حتى يعلم حكم الله فيه ويسأل العلماء ويقتدي بالمتبعين لسنة محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم الذين يدلون على طاعة الله ويحذرون من اتباع الشيطان. Nor is it permissible for him to engage in any action until he knows the judgment of Allah concerning that act. So before a person engages in any act, if he does not know whether this is halal or haram, he has to he has to find out. He has to know whether this is halal or haram. And this is um, the, where the Prophet ﷺ says, طَلَبُ الْعِلْمِ فَرِيضَةٌ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ That seeking knowledge is incumbent upon every Muslim. So things related to his worship, and things related to his daily life, interaction with people, interaction with whatever it may be, he has to know the in, the the hukum of Allah. And if he does not know the hukum of Allah, then if he engages in that matter, even if it turns out that this matter was actually permissible, if he does not know that this is whether this is permissible or, or haram, by engaging that ma- in, in that thing, he has now done a prohibited act, even if it turns out that that max- that, that that matter was actually permissible. Now, how does he know the hukum of this thing? Imam al-Akhdari then mentions, وَيَسْأَلَ الْعُلَمَاء He must ask the scholars and imitate those who follow the traditions of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa those who direct people to the obedience of the law and warn them from following the shaitan. So, to find out the rulings re- related to this thing, he has to ask the ulama. Either by asking them if they're present or by going to the text that they left. But the conditions of this person that he's asking, there, there are two conditions. One, al-ulama, they have to be scholars. They actually have to have knowledge. So if a person does not have knowledge, it's not permissible for him to ask 
anything about the deen from him. So he has to have knowledge. A person has to know that he's actually studied. And he studied with scholars. And he's been given permission to teach. And he has an isnad, uh, a chain of transmission from his scholars. That these scholars have studied with people. And they were given permission to teach by their teachers. Who were given permission to teach by their teachers. And so on. Back to the Sahaba and back to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that's the first condition. That they actually have to have knowledge. So if a person does not have knowledge, it's haram to ask um, him about matters of the deen. So if a person knows that he has not studied, even asking him, even if you know that you're not going to listen to what he's saying, to merely ask a person that does not have knowledge is haram, according to the Sharia. Then the second is that the scholars who imitate the, and follow the traditions of the Messenger of Allah. And he mentions this because this is the second condition of, of the people that we ask. The person not only has to have knowledge, but he has to have implementation of his knowledge in accordance with the Quran and with, uh, in accordance with the Sunnah. And so we know that there are scholars that have knowledge, that have sometimes immense knowledge, but they do not implement their, their knowledge. And so we, are, we, we have to stay away from these people. And the Prophet ﷺ warned us about this, these people. He said that he does not fear anything for his ummah more than the evil scholars. And these are the people that will order people to do things and they will not implement it themselves. Or sometimes they would, they would change the sharia. They would change the rulings. So if a person does not see the person implementing their knowledge... Then, um, then they cannot a a um, ask um, ask them about the sharia. They cannot study with them, and so um, you cannot take knowledge from a person, even if he has knowledge. You cannot take it from him if he's a fasiq, if he's not implementing his knowledge. And we know that even scholars can can be fusa, can be deviant Muslims. Just because a person has knowledge does not mean that they're righteous merely by their knowledge. Iblis, the anatullahi uh, alay, the the head devil. Has um, uh, has has immense knowledge, has great knowledge. He's been here for 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 many many countless years on, upon the earth, and so he has he has knowledge, but he, his knowledge does not benefit him at, at all. And then there are also hadith talking about um, places in hell, wal billah, that are specific for people that um, that know have knowledge and do not implement it, like places specifically in the hellfire. Um, that are for people that have memorized the Quran and do not implement what they've what what the Quran is saying, or about the scholars that on the day of judgment their students will be led into the hell jannah, and the teacher will be led into the hellfire, and the students will ask the scholar, why are we going into jannah and you're going into hell, and you taught us how to get into jannah? He said, I did not implement my knowledge, and the Quran says that the the about the people. He says, do you enjoin righteousness to pe uh, to people and forget yourselves? So we have to look for the scholars that are following the sunnah outwardly and inwardly. And they are the people who direct, those who direct people to the obedience of Allah and warn them from following the shaitan. This is the characteristic of the people. They have implemented their knowledge and they have a deep desire to save themselves and to save their families and to save the Muslims from following the, uh, the, the, the paths that would take them away from Allah. The paths of the shaitan. وَلَا يَرْضَى لِنَفْسِهِ مَا رَضِيَهُ الْمُفْلِسُونَ الَّذِينَ ضَاعَتْ أَعْمَارُهُمْ فِي غَيْرِ طَاعَةِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى فَيَا حَسَرَتَهُمْ وَيَا طُولَ بُكَائِهِمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Nor should he accept for himself what bankrupt people accept for themselves, those who have wasted their lives in other than obedience to Allah the Exalted. Oh, how great is their loss and how extensive their weeping will be on the day of standing. This is in reference to a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ asked the Sahaba, Do you know who the bankrupt person is? And the Sahaba responded by saying, He's the one amongst us who does not have any uh, wealth or does not have any belongings. And, he, and the Prophet ﷺ said, No, that's not the bankrupt person. The bankrupt person is the one who in this life fasted and he prayed and he gave them charity. But at the same time, he backbit this person and he took the right of this person and he harmed this person. So on Yom Al-Qiyamah, he comes with good actions and he comes with bad actions. And so the people that he oppressed will come and take, his, um, take their rights from him. And they'll do that by taking his right actions, his good deeds, his hasanat. And when, he's, when all his hasanat are taken, then they come with their bad 
then if they're still coming and still uh, people that he oppressed are still coming and, and asking for their rights, then they give him their sayyat, they give him their bad actions. So he's saying, don't be in the state that this person was in the dunya. Because now this person on Yom Al-Qiyamah, he's lost all his good actions and now he's taking on more bad actions and he's bankrupt. He's a spiritually bankrupt person. So he's saying, don't be pleased with yourself what this person was pleased with. And that uh, um, the thing that that person was pleased with in the dunya was that he allowed himself to be deluded by his good actions. He thought by doing his good a- by doing those good actions, those bad actions that he was also being uh, that he was also engaging in at the same time are not going to harm him. So this person was in a state of heedlessness. So he says, "Do not uh, be pleased with yourself, with that which pleased the bankrupt people. Don't be pleased with uh, doing good actions and at the same time doing bad actions. Don't think that those good actions are going to save you, even if you've done bad actions." That stop the bad actions and continue the good actions. And then he says, Oh, how great is their loss and how extensive their weeping will be on the day of standing, a day when their uh, realization of their loss and their weeping will not benefit them in the least. Nas'alullahu subhanahu wa yuwafiqana litiba'i sunnati nabiyyina wa shafi'ina wa sayyidina Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah the Exalted to give us success in following the way of our Prophet, Intercessor and Master Muhammad. Prayers and peace of Allah be upon him. Fasulun fit taharati. A taharatu qismani. Taharatu hadithin wa taharatu khabathin. Wala yusrihu al jami'u illa bil ma'a al tahiri al mutahiri. In this next section, Imam al Akhdari rahimahullah says that this is a chapter on purity. Purity or tahara in the Arabic language literally means nawafa or cleanliness. Its definition according to the sharia is as follows. Purity is of two types, tahara. Tahara to hadithin. It's purity from those things which vitiate or break ritual purity. Hadith. This is the hadith if a person breaks his wudu, then he's in a state of hadith. It's not something physically that's on his limbs or on his body if he's in a, the greater state of impurity. Um... The, the the state of Janaba, but it's a state that's upon his limbs or upon his entire body that has to be removed, has to be purified. So this is Taharat uh, We gain purity from two things, from those things which break the ritual purity, the Hadath, and also the Taharat Khabathin, the purity from the Khabath or the, uh, the Najasa, those things deemed unclean by the Sharia or the filth the impurities, the najasa. And those are things such as urine, blood, feces, pus, vomit that's been changed, portions of dead animals, unslaughtered animals. These are all examples of najasa. These things, if they're on the body or on the clothes of a person or on the area where a person is going to play, pray, they have to be removed. A person has to attain tahara from them. ولا يصح الجميع إلا بالماء الطاهر المطهر وهو الذي لم يتغير لونه أو طعمه أو رائحته بما يفارقه غالبا كالزيت والسمن والدسم كله والوذح والصابون والوسخ ونحوه. So when we again attain purity, it is only pure and purifying water. Pure water that is طاهر and is purifying. It's مطهر. It has the ability to purify. Which can remove impurities. This is the water that's tahir, it's pure, and it's mutahir, it's purifying. The definition is that it is water which has retained its its original color, smell, and taste. So it has not been changed by anything. If the water has been changed in one of those three qualities, or two of them, or all of them, then it is no longer pure and purifying. So it is not changed due to things that are not normally part of it, such as oil butter, grease, or such things as dung, soap, filth, and the like. Those things that he mentioned and other things like them are not normally part of water. Water in their natural state. Water that's taken from wells, from taps, from rivers, from oceans, rainwater. These things that he mentioned are not normally a part of water. So if they change the water in any of one of the three, those three qualities, then it is no longer pure and purifying. It, cannot, it can no longer be used to attain purity. So if the water has a little bit of milk in it, or it has a little bit of soap in it, or it has a little bit of um, oil in it, 
then this water is no longer pure and purifying. It, 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 could, it could be pure in the sense that you can use it for cooking and cleaning, but it's not purifying. So if water gets soap in it, then it is no longer purifying, but it could be pure. And so you could use it for washing clothes, for washing dishes, or so forth, but you cannot use it for attaining purity. There is no harm. There is no harm in such things as dirt, clay, salt marsh, baked brick, and the like. These things that he mentioned are things that, um, that, that are normally a part of water or are constituents of the earth, and so for that reason, if they, get, um, if they change one of the qualities of the water, they do not harm it. So if you have water, rainwater that comes, into, uh, uh, comes down onto the ground and is now changed because of the earth, it has now a sandy color or a taste, then that's not harmed because this is a thing that is not naturally part of the water, so it does not harm the, the water. Or you have salt, salty water. Salt is, uh, is, is, is a natural thing that's natural uh, to, uh, to um, could be a natural part of water, so it does not harm it. Or you go to a well that, um, that has minerals that causes it to have a yellowish tint or a reddish tint or to have some sort of a smell because of the minerals, then those things, because they're naturally a part of the water, they do not harm the state of the water. So even if it changes as one or all of the qualities of the water, it does not harm it. So that water is still pure and purifying. فصل في النجاسة إذا تعينت النجاسة غسل محلها فإن التبست غسل الثوب كله ومن شك في إصابة النجاسة نضح وإن أصابه شيء شك في نجاسته فلا نضح عليه This is the chapter on impurity. If impurity, those things that were mentioned earlier, blood, feces, urine, pus, so forth, if impurity is discovered on one's body or garment, then the place should be washed, just that place. But if it is hard to identify, then the entire garment should be washed. So if you know that that impurity got in a specific portion of your body or clothes, then all you have to do is wash that area. But if it is hard to identify, meaning that you know that this impurity got onto your body or onto your clothes but you don't know exactly where then you wash the entire garment or you wash an area large enough to where you know that you have now cleaned this cleaned this garment and this washing means that you you put it on the tah, the water that's tahir and mutahir the pure and purifying water and you put it on the area and you allow the the the, the water to flow off or you know that the water, once it's poured on that, that garment, it's now diluted that, uh, that, that thing to where there's no longer any traces of that, of that impurity. So if you have blood on the, uh, on the garment, for example, or any other impurity, and now you wash it off, as long as the water that's being poured on is coming off with a change in it because of that impurity, it's changed in its color or its um, smell, then that garment is not purified. You have to keep pouring water and washing that area until the water that's coming off no longer has any traces of that impurity. So if you can do that um, without wringing, that's fine. There's no, uh, it is not necessary to wring out the clothes. If you can just pour water on the clothes and you know that there's no traces of that, um, that impurity, that now you've diluted that impurity to where it's no longer can be, um, um, it no longer changes the water at all, then, then that, then that, though, then that cloth is purified. You don't have to wring it out. You can, you can pour water on it, or you could put it in a bucket of water or a tub of water, and then hang it out to dry. As for one who doubts whether impurity has soiled him or not, then he should spray water over it. If you know that there's an impure impurity in the area. And you see it kind of splash, or, or you see it, um, 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 your, clo your clothes may or may not have touched it. So you know there's an impurity in the area, but you doubt whether or not it actually got onto you. Then all you must do is just lightly sprinkle water, sprinkle water over that area. Should he doubt whether the substance is actually impure or not, then he need not sprinkle over it. So if a person finds something on his clothes and does not know what it is. He knows definitely it's on his clothes or on his body, but he doesn't know what it is. He sees something red, he doesn't know. Is this ink or is this blood? He sees something brown, he doesn't know. Is this feces or is this mud? 
or he sees something uh, wet on his body. He doesn't know, is this urine or is this water? So he doubts whether the, the material is actually Im, impure or pure. In this case, he does not uh, wash it, sprinkle it, or do anything to it. He leaves it alone. Because the origin of all things are, are pure until it's proven that they're impure. So the impurity on the body, to recap this section, the impurity can either be one of four things. You can either, it either got onto your body and you know exactly where it was. It got onto your body, but you don't know where it got on. You doubt whether or not it got onto your body. Or you know it got onto your body, but you don't know what it is. So in the first situation, you know what it is and you know where it got onto your body, you wash that particular area. You know what it is, and you know it got onto your body, but you don't know where, then you wash the entire garment, or you wash an area large enough, so that you have uh, that no doubt remains about uh, that, that matter still being on your body. Or you know that this matter is impure, but you doubt whether it got onto you or not. You sprinkle that area. And then the fourth situation, you know it's on your body or on your clothes, but you don't know what it is. So in that case, you leave it alone. وَمَنْ تَذَكَّرَ النَّجَاسَةَ وَهُوَ فِي الصَّلَاةِ قَطَعَ إِلَّا يَخَافَ خُرُوجُ الْوَقْتِ So in these, four, um, in these four instances, you could either remember it before the prayer, during the prayer, or after the prayer. If you remember it before the prayer, then you have to wash it off. And if a person goes ahead and prays, then his prayer is invalid because he's now prayed with an impurity on him. If he goes into the prayer, forgetting that these thing, this thing is on him, or not knowing, and then during the prayer he realizes that this impurity is on his body or on his clothes, then he has to cut the prayer off, go wash that thing off, and then begin the prayer from the beginning, unless he fears that by doing that he's going to lose the time of the prayer. So say, for example, it's morning time, the sun's just about to come up, you're about to finish your prayer, and you remember that you have some impurities on your clothes. And you know that you do not have enough time to go wash your clothes or find some other clothes and then come back and complete this prayer, start this prayer and complete it um, before the sun comes up or before the time of any of the prayers goes out, then you continue on your prayer. So if someone is praying and he recalls an impurity on him, then he should break his prayer unless he fears missing the prayer in its proper time. In which case, he would continue on praying with that impurity on him. And this is because the prayer's time is so important. It, gives, it is given precedence over the removal, impurities, the removal of impurities from the body or from the clothes. وَمَنْ صَلَّى بِهَا نَاسِيًا وَتَذَكَّرَ بَعْدَ السَّلَامَ أَعَادَ فِي الْوَقْتِ We discussed, if you remember, the najasa before the prayer, then during the prayer. And now Imam al-Akhdari rahimahullah says, as for one who prays with an impurity due to forgetfulness, then recalls the impurity after the salam, after completing the prayer, he should repeat the prayer if there is still time. So he completed, he did not remember the najasa before the prayer or during the prayer, but now after the prayer, he realizes that he prayed with najasa. For him, his prayer is correct, but if, he, if there's still time, then he should repeat his prayer. And when it says he should repeat his prayer, it means that it is recommended to repeat his prayer. His prayer is valid. It is not incumbent for him to repeat his prayer, but it is recommended for him to repeat it if there's still time. Now, if the time of that particular prayer has gone out, then it is not incumbent nor recommended for him to repeat that prayer. فَصْلٌ فَرَائِضُ الْوُضُوءِ سَبْعَةٌ النِّيَّةُ وَغَسْلُ الْوَجْهِ وَغَسْلُ الْيَدَيْنِ إِلَى الْمَرْفَقَيْنِ وَمَسْحُ الرَّأْسِ وَغَسْلُ الرَّجْلَيْنِ إِلَى الْكَعْبَيْنِ وَالدَّلْكُ وَالْفَوْرِ The obligations of wudu are seven. The first is intention. And this intention is either one of three things. فَلْيَنْوِي رَفْعَ حَدَثٍ أَوْ مُفْتَرَضٍ So he should intend the removal of uh, the impurity. He either re re intends that he's in a state of hadith and he wants to remove himself from this hadith. He wants to remove this hadith from his body. So he intends by doing this wudu that he's removing this hadith. This is one of the intentions, the three intentions that he can have. Or he intends the obligation. Or he intends that uh, because the prayer is an obligation and the wudu is a condition of the prayer 
that that makes the wudu now an obligation. So he intends that this wudu is, is obligatory upon him. So he's doing it. So that's another one of the intentions that he can have. Or the third, or or he makes the intention of permitting the impermissible. Which means, if something was impermissible for him when he was not in wudu, like touching the mushaf, touching the Qur'an, or doing tawaf of the house, going around the house, then he says, I want to put myself in a state of wudu, so those things now become permissible for me. So that's the third of the three intentions that he has to have, or um, that he can have for this wudu. He can do any one of the three, he can do two, and it's best to do all three. And if he does the intention of wudu for one of the things, it makes the others permissible. So, if he does wudu to pray dhuhr, it's permissible for him to touch the mushaf with that wudu. Or if he touches, if he makes wudu to touch the mushaf, and a prayer time comes along, then it's permissible for him to pray that prayer with the wudu that he did to touch the mushaf. So these three intentions are interchangeable. But if he does not have an intention for the wudu, then his wudu is not valid because of the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ says, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ Verily, actions are by their intentions. So if a person goes and washes his, uh, just washes up for the, uh, the intention of cleanliness and does not make present the intention that he's actually doing this as an act of worship, then he's wetting his limbs, he's washing them, but it's not considered a wudu. Or if somebody jumps in a, in a pool or a, a pond, gets all his limbs wet, and rubs them, but he does not have the intention, then this is not a wudu. He has to have the intention. Also, the second obligation of the wudu is that he washes his face. And the definition of the face is from the um, natural um, hairline down to the chin, the chin, the entire chin bone. Now, if a person has receding hairlines, he only goes to where the hair naturally would have began if there was hair there. So he begins from that in the top down to his chin, including the entire jawbone, but not underneath the 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 not the neck and not underneath the chin, just down to the jawbone and including a little portion of the bone from underneath, but not the entire area underneath the 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 jaw. Then from side to side, it's from the little area of the the cartilage that if the if it were uh, which is called in Arabic the watid, if it were to be pressed in, it would close up the air canal from that to the other side. That is the the watid, that little area of cartilage. If it's not actually considered part of the face, but a portion of it has to be washed for the for the wudu to be complete. So that's the entire face. Then he should also make sure to wash his lips and uh, that's if he says the letter meem when he finishes it what is shown has to be washed. So if he says meem that area of the lips that is shown has to be washed. Also underneath the nose it should be uh, a person should make sure to wash underneath the nose and so forth. وَغَسُلُ الْيَدَيْنِ إِلَى الْمِرْفَقَيْنِ Washing the two arms up to and including the elbows is the third obligation of the wudu. So he has to wash the hands, getting in between the fingers, getting in between the wrinkles on the knuckles, up to and including the elbows. وَمَسْحُ الرَّأْسِ Then also wiping the head is an obligation of the wudu. And the head or the skull is defined from, from just, a, just a below the temple there is a protruding bone. From that bone, uh, with the bone, the, the, the bone that's felt behind the ear, all the way back down to the nape of the neck. That entire area of the head must be wiped. وَغَصْلُ الرِّجْلَيْنِ إِلَى الْكَعْبَيْنِ Washing the two feet up to and including the ankles is the fifth obligation. وَالدَّلْكُ Rubbing the parts that are washed. So not only are these parts that we mentioned, they have to have water upon them, and wa they also have to be rubbed. So if a person merely pours water on these limbs, that's not considered a washing. They actually have to be rubbing. And the rubbing is not something very light or something very hard. It's just a light rubbing of the limbs so that the, the washing is complete. And then also continuity during the actual act of wudu. So a person cannot do half the wudu now 
and then half later, or in the middle of the wudu, he begins something else, and he completes his wudu an hour later or half an hour later. He has to complete the entire act of wudu in the same sitting. And if he delays, if he allows a delay to come in his wudu, a long delay, then, his, then he has to start all over. And that delay is defined as what would dry the limbs in moderate conditions. So if a person does wudu, and he, in the midst of it he stops to talk to somebody, or to answer the phone, or whatever it may be, and now a long time has passed, and that, past, uh, that time that has passed is, is enough time that would normally dry the limbs in normal conditions, then his wudu is invalid. So when we say drying the limbs in normal conditions, we don't look at uh, a, uh, a cold, an extremely cold climate or a hot climate because in a cold climate, the limbs are going to dry. It's going to take a long time for them to dry. And in a hot climate, they're going to dry very fast. So we look at just normal conditions in a normal area on a normal person. He's not inside in a closed-in area. He's not on the top of a mountain where there's a lot of wind. He's not um, uh, in, in, uh, enclosed by trees or by walls. He's just in an, in an area that's uh, normal ele elevation, normal conditions. How long would it take for him, his limbs to dry? That's the time that a person is allowed um, to give it as a space within his wudu. If it goes more than that, then he has to start the wudu from the beginning. وَسُنَنُهُ غَسْلُ الْيَدَيْنِ إِلَى الْكُوْعِينِ عِنْدَ الشُّرُوعِ وَالْمَضْمَضَةُ وَالْإِسْتِنْشَاقُ وَالْإِسْتِنْثَارُ وَرَدُ مَسْحِ الرَّأْسِ وَمَسْحُ الْأُذْنَيْنِ وَتَجْدِدُ الْمَاءِ إِلَهُمَا وَالْتَرْتِيبُ بَيْنِ الْفَرَائِضِ The author, rahimahullah, then goes on to the section of sunnahs of wudu. The sunnahs of wudu are eight in number. The first one is washing the hands up to the wrists at the beginning. So the beginning of the wudu, washing the wrists, then rinsing the mouth, also rinsing the mouth lightly, bringing water up to the mouth with the right hand, and then rinsing it out lightly, and spitting it out uh, lightly without making a sound in either the rinsing or the spitting um, is a sunnah. If a person rinses very um, very much and makes a sound or gargles, that's considered makru, it's disliked because it's um, being excessive. And then if they when they if they make sounds it's all it's makru just as making sounds while eating is considered makru or disliked. Walmadmadatu walistinshaqum istinshaq which is lightly sniffing water up the nostrils. So to take water with the right hand and then lightly sniff water up into the nose, not sniffing very hard because that would harm the nose, or doing it very lightly and not actually getting any water in the nose. Um, he just does it lightly, sniffing water into the nose. And then istintharu, which is lightly blowing the water out the nostrils. He doesn't do it very heavily to where he's like cleaning out his nostrils um, um, uh, very heavily. That's also considered disliked. And the hadith um, said um, of the Prophet ﷺ says not to do that because it's like a donkey sneezing. So he lightly blows water out of the nostrils. Waraddu mashir ra'si. Also a return wipe of the head. Because the first wipe of the head was mentioned in the obligations. And the return wipe is considered a sunnah. Then the renewing the water for the... Uh, then wiping the two ears, وَمَسْحُ الْأُذْنَيْنِ is also considered a sunnah. And renewing the water for the wiping of the ears, which is a separate sunnah. So after a person wipes his head and return wipes his head, if there's still water on his hands, he can go ahead and wipe the ears and attain one sunnah. But if he renews water for the wiping of the ears, he has now attained a second sunnah. And there's actually a third sunnah that's not mentioned in the text, but it's that he takes his index finger and lightly sticks it into the ear canals while wiping the ear. And only lightly, because doing more than that would harm the ear. And um, the wudu is not there to harm the person's body. It's actually there to benefit him spiritually and physically. Then, this, then the, uh, the next sunnah that he mentions is following the order given for the obligations, i.e. face first, then, har then arms, then head. So the obligations of the wudu that were mentioned in the previous section, the obligatory limbs that have to be washed, the arms, the face, the arms, the head and the feet, were mentioned in that order by Allah in the Qur'an. In the Quran it says, if you go to the prayer, then wash your face and your arms 
wipe your head, and then wash your feet. So to follow that order is considered sunnah. If somebody does not follow that order, it does not invalidate the wudu, but it is makru, it is disliked to go against that order. And all of these sunnahs are like that, in that if a person leaves a sunnah, it's not, it does not invalidate his wudu, but it is makru, it's disliked, because it's something that the Prophet ﷺ did constantly, and he never left, but there was not a proof that would uh, cause this to be considered an obligation. So that's the definition of a sunnah. A sunnah in its hukum, in, in general, in a general sense, everything that the Prophet ﷺ did was a sunnah. That was his way. But the ulama then take his actions or his deeds and then categorize them. It might be an obligation, it might be a sunnah, it might be mustahab recommended, or and so forth. So if if he did something and there's a proof that it's an obligation, then it's a fard or a wajib. If he did something constantly, never leaving it, but there was not a proof that this was an obligation, then it's given the hukum of sunnah. If he did something, but sometimes would leave it, then it's given the hukum of mandub or mustahab, which is in the next section. Then he says, وَمَنْ نَسِيَ فَرْضًا مِنْ عَضَائِهِ فَإِنْ تَذَكَّرْهُ بِالْقُرْبِ فَعَلَهُ وَمَا بَعْدُهُ فَإِنْ طَالَ وَإِنْ طَالَ فَعَلَهُ وَحْدَهُ وَأَعَادَ مَا صَلَّى قَبْلَهُ if one forgets an obligation of wudu and recalls it shortly thereafter, then he should return to it and repeat what, follow, what, what follows. So if a person in, is in the midst of wudu and he forgets having performed an obligation, he has to go back to that um, thing, that obligatory limb, wash it, and then it's sunnah for him to wash what's after it. If he does not do that, if he just goes back to the limb he missed and then goes back to where he left off, then it's going to cause him to have performed the wudu out of the order that it should have been performed in. For example, if a person's washing his feet and he forgets washing his face, then he should go back, wash his face, and then f perform what's after it. If he does not do that, if, he, if he's on his left foot and he goes back to his fate, face and then he comes back and completes his left foot, then he has now performed the wudu out of its proper order. He has, he has, done the feet, he has washed the feet before washing the face. And he says, recall it shortly thereafter. Meaning if he forgets this obligation, if he remembers this obligation within the wudu, if time elapsed, then he should go back and perform only what was forgotten and repeat what prayers he performed with that wudu. وَإِن طَالَ فَعَلُهُ وَحْدَهُ وَأَعَادَ مَا صَلَّى قَبْلَهُ So he just mentioned that if a person remembered that misobligation within the wudu, or shortly after wudu, meaning a time had not passed long enough to dry the limbs. If a, um, meaning a long time had passed. So if a long time has passed, then he should go back and perform only what was forgotten and repeat what prayers he had performed with that wudu. So if he had performed the wudu and forgot one of the obligations and did not remember that obligation until a long time had passed, an hour later or a half an hour later, the important thing is that a time passed long enough that would dry the limbs in normal conditions, then that's considered a long time and he does and he only goes back and fulfills that one obligation and he doesn't do what's after it, but he has to repeat any prayers that he had prayed with that wudu because it's a deficient wudu. وَإِن تَرَكَ سُنَّةً فَعَلَهَا وَلَا يُعِيدُ الصَّلَاةَ should he leave off a sunnah from the prayer, then he need only fulfill it without repeating the prayers done with that wudu. So if after doing the wudu, a time passes, and then he remembers that he did not fulfill one of the sunnahs, then he should go back and fulfill that sunnah. But if he had prayed any prayers with that, then he does not need to re repeat that prayer, because leaving a sunnah from the wudu does not invalidate the wudu. وَمَنْ نَسِيَ لُمْعَةً غَسَلَهَا وَحْدَهَا بِنِيَّةٍ وَإِنْ صَلَّى قَبْلَ ذَلِكَ أَعَادَ Should one forget only a portion of a limb or a part of the face, he need only wash the part in question, but with intention. This is what is called the lum'a. The lum'a is a portion of the limb that was not washed, or there was something on the limb that prevented water from getting to the limb, prevented that portion from getting washed, such as a piece of tape, a piece of food that dried, 
um, some paint or something that was on the skin and the water did not penetrate it and he was not able to wash that area. If he notices that after fulfilling the wudu, then he does not have to complete his entire wudu or even wash that entire limb. What he merely does is wash that one area after removing that thing that prevented the water from getting there or wash that area that he forgot to wash and then repeat any prayers he performed with that wudu because again, it's deficient. وَمَنْ تَذَكَّرَ الْمَضْمَضَةَ وَالْإِسْتِنْشَاقَ بَعْدَ إِنْ شَرَعَ فِي الْوَجْهِ فَلَا يَرْجِعُ إِلَيْهِمَا حَتَّى يُتِمَّ وُضُوءَهُ Should one recall that he has not washed his hands at the onset or cleaned his nostrils and yet he has begun to wash his face, he should not return to either of them until he has completed his wudu. So if a person leaves off one of the sunnahs, like washing the hands or cleaning the nostrils, and then goes to an ob the obligation that follows it, so you wash the hands, which is a sunnah, wash the mouth, which is a sunnah, clean the nostrils, and then do a fard, which is washing the face. But say a fir person forgets to rinse the mouth and the nose, and then goes to straight, straight to washing his face. So now he has um, skipped a sunnah, he forgot to do a sunnah, and he went to an obligation. He says that he should not return to that sunnah until he has completed his entire wudu. And this is because he has um, overlooked a sunnah and went to an obligation. And the principle is that you do not leave an obligation to go back to the sunnah. So he completes his face and actually completes his entire wudu. And then once the wudu is completed, then he does that sunnah that he missed. And this, in, in this is a lesson that we do not leave an obligation for a sunnah wherever it may be. Because a sunnah is not an obligation. Leaving a sunnah would be disliked, but it's not a sin. Whereas leaving an obligation is a sin. And this is just to teach us that principle. Whereas if he did, did um, if, he went, he, if he washed his face, began washing his face, and went back to washing the, the mouth, he should have delayed the, um, that missed sunnah until the wudu was over. فَضَائِلُ الْوُضُوءِ وَفَضَائِلُهُ التَّسْمِيَةُ وَالسِّوَاكُ وَالزَّائِدُ عَلَى الْغَسْلَةِ الْأُولَى فِي الْوَجْهِ وَالْيَدَيْنِ The virtues of the wudu are eight. The virtues known as, as the fadail, sometimes called the mustahab or the mandub. These are all words that mean the same thing. In this category, it's things that the Prophet ﷺ used to do, but sometimes he would leave them. So we said the obligations are things that he would always do, and they were. there's a proof that it's an obligation. Sunnas, things that are given the hukum of sunnah, is that it's something that he would do often, and he would never leave, but he there wasn't there wasn't a proof to show that it's an obligation. The fadail are things that he would do often, but sometimes he would leave. And so they're called, they're given the hukum of fadila or mandub or mustahab. He says here, the fadail are eight, and there's actually uh, other scholars mention even more, and in some texts it goes up to 30, but here he mentions some of them, some of the recommended acts, the more um, the more, um, the stronger recommended acts. <clears throat> and the first one is a tasmiyatu, saying Bismillah at the beginning. So before, uh, once washing the right hand, a person would say Bismillah. <clears throat> also the siwak, brushing the teeth before the wudu. Brushing the teeth either with a tooth stick, the miswak that's made from the root of the arak tree or the branch of, of a tree that's known such as the zaytun tree, the olive tree, or a, palm tree, a date palm tree, a person would clean his teeth. Or if he can't find something like that, he can use something uh, even like the plastic toothbrushes that are commonly used. The best thing would though be to use the, the siwak because that's the sunnah. But the important thing is to clean the mouth. So even if he takes a piece of cloth and cleans his teeth, uh, that's uh, that fulfills this recommendation. وَزَّائِدُ عَلَى الْغَسْلَةِ الْأُولَى فِي الْوَجْهِ وَالْيَدَيْنِ Washing the face and hands more than once. Each uh, so washing the hands the uh, in the in the wudu would be rec uh, would be the obligation the first time. Then the second and the third time would each be a recommended act. Washing the face the first time is rec is an obligation the first time. Then the second and the third are uh, recommended. So every time where there's a second and a third washing, it's recommended. Will be daya to be muqaddam al rasi. Beginning with the front of the forehead. 
So when a person washes their face, they don't start with their cheeks or their chin. They start with the top of, of their face, their forehead, and then go down. And the same thing goes for the hands. You start with the tips of the fingers and then go down towards the elbows. With, when washing the feet, you start with the front portion of the feet, the toes, and then wash the other portion. وَتَرْتِبُ sunani. Then also, following the order of the sunnas. So the sunnas that were mentioned in the previous section were given in a certain order. So to keep them in that order is recommended. So we learn that keeping the, obliga the, oblig the obligations of the wudu, keeping them in order is a sunnah. Then keeping the sunnas in order is recommended. And then another recommend recommendation is keeping the sunnas in order with the obligation. So you have sometimes a sunnah, a sunnah, then an obligation, then a sunnah, then an obligation. So washing the hands, you have a sunnah, rinsing the mouth, sunnah, uh, rinsing the nose, uh, cleaning the nose, sunnah, and then the face, fard, and then so on. وَتَقْدِيمُ الْيُمْنَا عَلَى الْيُسْرَى also recommended is giving precedence to the right limbs over the left. So doing the right hand before the left, doing the right arm before the left, doing the right foot before the left. وَيَجِبُ تَخْلِيلُ أَصَابِعِ الْيَدَيْنِ Also necessary is to wash between the fingers. So when washing the hands in the obligatory wash, a person has to rub in between the fingers. And they would do that by inter, uh, interlo interlacing the fingers. And it's done from the top, um, so you would take, when washing the right hand, you would take the left hand and put the palm on the back of the right hand, and then run the fingers, interlace them, um, um, and then wash in between them. And then the same for when washing the left hand, with the right hand on top, and then interlacing them and rubbing in between the fingers. This is incumbent because when you wash the arm hands, we said that uh, one of the obligations is rubbing. And if you merely just wash the hands without paying attention and rubbing in between the fingers, then you're not rubbing in between the fingers. So maybe water is getting in between the fingers, but they're not being rubbed. And so because rubbing is one of the obligations of wudu, you would have to interlace the fingers and rub in between the fingers. Whereas it is only a virtue concerning the toes. So when washing the feet, to actually rub in between the toes is recommended. A person would have to get water in between the toes, but if they do not rub in between the toes, it does not invalidate their wudu. But it is recommended for them to rub in between the toes. وَيَجِبُ تَخْلِيلُ الْلِحْيَةِ الْخَفِيفَةِ فِي الْوُضُوءِ دُونَ الْكَثِيفَةِ وَيَجِبُ تَخْلِيلُهَا فِي الْغُسْلِ وَلَوْ كَانَتْ كَثِيفَةً as for the beard, if it, is thick, if it is thick, it is enough to wipe over it. But should the underlying skin be discernible, then one must rub until the water reaches the skin. So here in the text, the author says that, um, uh, refers to the beard specifically, but this also includes any of the facial hair. So the eyebrows, the mustache, and the beard. The mustache and the beard, of course, being for the men, and the eyebrows for both the men and the women. If it is thick... It's enough to wipe over it. So if a person uh, at first glance were to look at somebody's facial hair and they cannot see the underlying skin, then that's considered thick. And so what's uh, what you do not have to get water down to the skin. You would just wipe over it and lightly um, run the fingers through that hair. Run the fingers through the beard or through the mustache or through the, the eyebrows. Whereas if the underlying skin can be discernible, and that's defined as if a person were to look at them, at first glance they can see the skin, then it is not enough to wipe over that facial hair. Water actually has to get down to the skin. As for ghusl, it is the same whether it is light or thick. One must, under, one must wash the underlying skin. So the beard as well as the other facial hair during the ghusl, during the full body wash, a person has to wash uh, and get water down to the skin even if it's thick. فصل نواقض الوضوء أحداث وأسباب فالأحداث البول والغائط والريح والمذي والودي والأسباب النوم الثقيل والإغضاء والسكر والجنون والقبلة ولمس المرأة إن قصد اللذة أو وجدها ومس الذكر بباطن الكف أو بباطن الأصابع This is the section on the things that nullify wudu. They are both events, they are either events or reasons. Those things which nullify wudu are either events, أحداث, and these are things that nullify the wudu in and of themselves, or possible reasons for the uh, events, asbab al-ahdath, things that would allow uh, a hadith to occur. 
As for the events, as for the hadith, they are the following. Al-Bawlu, urine. Al-Ghaitu, feces. So these are things that are break the wudu and they're considered hadiths or events. And in Arabic you see it's called Ghaitu. And this is taken from the, um, in the Arabic word, ra'it literally means a, a, a low-lying place in the earth, a, de- a depression in the land. Because the Arabs would say, if a person went to use the bathroom, he would say, ذَهَبَ إِلَى الْغَائِطِ He went to the low-lying land. In other words, he went to a place in the land where, it's, where he cannot be seen. It's a depression in the land and he, and he relieved himself there. So they would not specifically say, that he what he did there but they would say he went to that place so again like we were mentioning in the in the first section of al-akhdari about talking about things in a dignified manner this is one of the way the arabs would would refer to something in a dignified manner meaning the going to the the restroom he was they would say ذهب الى الغائط they went to the low lying place so the ghaith is feces it's a hadith and it breaks the wudu rih wind it's a hadith and it breaks the wudu madhyu is lusty fluid and it breaks the wudu. And he's going to define uh, later in this section exactly what is the medhi. It's a fluid that comes out after lustful thinking, touching, or looking. Well, what do you? What do you? Is prostatic fluid without lust. And it's a thick, whitish fluid that comes out usually after urine. And it could be caused by lifting, uh, after living, lifting heavy objects and a person urinates, it would come out after that. So the, the wedyu is a thick whitish fluid that comes out usually after urination. So the urine has already broken the wudu, but the fuqaha mentioned that the wadi, if it, they mentioned that it breaks the wudu because if uh, there is a case where it comes out by itself, then the person would know that it breaks the wudu. The medu that was just previously mentioned, it's a clear, it's a clear fluid, whereas the wedu is thick and it's white. Then Imam Al Akhbari mentions the asbab, and these are the possible reasons, things that if they occur, it could allow an event to happen. So for that reason, it actually breaks the wudu. The first is a nomu thaqilu, deep sleep. So if a person experiences deep sleep, that breaks his wudu. And the definition of deep sleep is that he's in a sleep um, that's deep enough to where if there were people talking around him, he no longer hears them. The voices or sounds around him are cut off from him. Or if he's holding something in his hand like a pen or a subha, a prayer beads or a book, it drops out of his hand and he does not feel that it dropped. Whereas if he were to drop, where if it, whereas if it were to drop out of his hand and he realized that it dropped, then this would be light sleep. So if he did not notice that thing dropping out of his hand, then it's considered deep sleep. Or if a person calls his name, and on the first time they call him in a regular voice, he does not respond. That's deep sleep. Light sleep would not break the wudu. And that's where he would still hear voices. If somebody called his name on the first time, he would respond. If he dropped something out of his hand, he would realize that it dropped, and so forth. Well, igma'u. Loss of consciousness is a sebab and it breaks the wudu. And it's either uh, either because a person became sick, they fainted, they were hit on the head, or whatever caused them to lose consciousness, that would break their wudu. Was sukru, also intoxication. If a person becomes intoxicated, then that would break their wudu. Was jununu, insanity, also breaks the wudu and it's a, it's a sebab. Was qublatu. Also, kissing breaks the wudu, and this if, is if this is if it is lips to lips, from a person who pleasure is normally derived from. So, for example, between a man and his wife, if they kiss lips to lips, even if there was no pleasure intended or experienced, that would break the wudu. Whereas, if a if a person um, kissed his daughter, or a person kissed their mother, these are not people that pleasure is normally derived from. So, even if the kiss was lips to lips. The, that does not break the wudu. So the qubla in Arabic is specifically if it is a kiss lips to lips. If it's a kiss from uh, on the cheek, then that's considered, that goes under the, the, the category of lems, which is the next thing that he mentions. Lustful touching if pleasure was intended or derived. So if a man touches another woman, 
regardless of whether it was halal or haram for him to touch. If he touched his wife, it was halal for him to touch. Or if he touched a woman um, um, that was not his wife, and he derived pleasure, or he intended pleasure, then that would break his wudu. So if a person touches another um, uh, person who pleasure is normally derived from, um, like in the case of a man to a woman, or vice versa, and they intend or they derive pleasure, then that would break their wudu. If they intended pleasure... Whether or not they experience pleasure, it breaks the wudu. And if they did not intend pleasure, then it would only break their wudu if they did, did experience pleasure. So there's four conditions. There's four states. Either he intended pleasure and he found it, breaks the wudu. He intended pleasure and he did not find it, it, it breaks the wudu. He did not intend pleasure and he found it, that breaks uh, that breaks the wudu. He did not intend pleasure and he did not find it. That's the only situation where it would not break the wudu. And the situations where he does not intend pleasure, that's like if a man and a wife, they hand something to each other or a person's in a marketplace and, they, and somebody just brushes up against them. They did not intend pleasure. So it would only break their wudu if they experienced pleasure. وَمَسُّ الذِّكْرِ بِبَاطَنِ الْكَفِّ أَوْ بِبَاطَنِ الصَّابِعِ Also for a male touching the private part with the palm or the inner part of the fingers or the sides. So for a man, if he touches his private part directly with either the bottom of the palm, the sides of the palm, the bottom or the sides of the fingers, that would break his wudu. Whereas if he touched his uh, private part with any other uh, part of his hand, the top of his hand or his arm, that would not break the wudu. And it would also not break the wudu if he touched his private part over clothing. So it has to be a direct contact with the bottom or the sides of the palms and the bottom or the sides of the fingers. وَمَنْ شَكَّ فِي حَدَثٍ وَجْبَ عَلَيْهِ الْوُضُوءُ إِلَّا يَكُونَ مُوَسْوِسًا فَلَا شَيْءَ عَلَيْهِ As for the one who doubts whether an event occurred or not, this necessitates wudu. So if a person does wudu and then later on he doubts whether it was broken or not, this necessitates wudu because the doubt would require him to do wudu. Whereas if a person doubted whether he broke his wudu or not, and then later on he regains certainty about having wudu, then he does not have to break the wudu. Unless this person has constant doubt, he's muwaswas, in that case he should ignore the doubt. So if a person is getting doubt about his wudu every day, um, even if it's only once a day, but consecutively, then he leaves this doubt. So if he has doubt one day, uh, he would, um, if he has doubt only once, then he would follow it up and do the wudu. But if now he gets it the second day, the second day he considers it waswasa, he considers it whisperings, and he leaves it. And then after that, if it keeps coming, he leaves it. So if it's coming um, cons uh, consecutively, even if it's only once a day, he would not, he would not follow it up. And this is incumbent for him to leave the waswasa because it's from the shaitan. And it actually could could harm the person if if he uh, if he uh, keeps following it up. Because what the shaitan wants to do is get to the aqidah of a person. He wants to get to the creed of a Muslim, and he knows that he can't go to the creed directly. So he has to work his way up. So the first way he goes, the first place he goes, is to the bahara of a person, to the cleanliness. He'll have them give them whisperings about cleaning themselves. Um, cleaning the najasa off, them, uh, uh, off themselves after using the restroom. He'll give them waswasa about their wudu. He'll give them waswasa about their prayer. So whenever he experiences waswasa, he has to leave it. It's incumbent for him to leave it. And that's the the the, the, the strongest medicine to remove waswasa, to remove whisperings from a person. It is also necessary to wash the entire private part from lusty, lusty emission, but he need not wash the testicles. وَيَجِبُ عَلَيْهِ غَسُلُ الذَّكْرِ كُلِّهِ مِنِ الْمَذْيِ وَلَا يَغْسِلُ الْأُنْثَيَيْنِ وَالْمَذْيُ هُوَ الْمَاءُ الْخَارِجُ عِنْدَ الشَّهْوَةِ الصُّغْرَى بِتَفَكُّرٍ أَوْ نَظَرٍ أَوْ غَيْرِهِ So it is necessary to wash the entire private part after experiencing lusty emission, the madhi, but he need not wash the uh, testicles. So he has to, after experiencing madhi, and he'll define exactly what it is, the, the male has to wash the entire private part, but he does not wash the testicles. The definition of lusty emission, or medhi, is a fluid that is emitted when one finds minor sexual pleasure either from lusty thoughts, gaze, or other means. And it's a clear fluid 
that comes out after these things. فصل لا يحل لغير المتوضئ صلاة ولا طواف ولا مس نسخة القرآن العظيم ولا جلدها لا بيده ولا بعود ونحوه إلا الجزء منها المتعلم فيه ولا مس لوح القرآن العظيم على غير الوضوء إلا لمتعلم فيه أو معلم يصححه. This is the section on things prohibited for the one without wudu. It is not permissible for someone who is not in wudu to pray, perform circumambulation around the Kaaba, tawaf, to touch a copy of the exalted Quran, even if it, even its cover, neither with the one's hand or a stick or other means, unless it is a small portion that one is learning from. So it is not permissible for a person who is not in wudu to pray. It's haram for a person to, per, to, to perform a prayer if he does not have wudu. It is also haram to perform tawaf around the Kaaba if a person does not have wudu. Because one of the conditions of tawaf is that they must be in a state of uh, wudu. Because the Prophet ﷺ said that the tawaf is like the prayer except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed us to speak during it. So a person during tawaf has to cover their nakedness, has to be free from impurities, and has to have wudu. It is also prohibited for the one without wudu to touch a copy of the exalted Qur'an, the mushaf, even if even its cover, neither with one's hand or stick. So if a person does not have wudu, it is not permissible for them to touch the Qur'an, the mushaf, and this is specifically a copy of the Qur'an with only Arabic. If it has a commentary of the Qur'an, either in English or Arabic, because a what they call a translation of the Qur'an is really a translation of its meanings, and so it is considered a commentary or a tafsir. So if it is a tafsir of the Qur'an, even if it contains the entire Qur'an, like the tafsir of the Jalalain, or like an um, entire translated copy into the English or Spanish language, then that's considered a tafsir, and it's permissible to touch it without wudu. The best thing, though, would be to have wudu while touching it, because there is a difference of opinion amongst the scholars. So it is recommended to, to get out of the difference of opinion uh, by not doing that. But it is permissible for that person to touch uh, a copy of a tafsir without wudu. The only thing that is haram for him to touch is a copy of the uh, Quran and Mus'haf if it is strictly in the Arabic language. And it's also not permissible to touch even if it, even its cover. So not only is it prohibited to touch the actual words that are written in the Quran, but even if even its cover, both with his hand or even with a stick, to carry it with a stick or to move it, to use something like even like a pencil to move the mushaf out of the way, would be considered prohibited. Unless it is a small portion that one is learning from. So if it's a small portion of the Quran, like a juz, they divide the Qur'an into 30ths or into 60ths. If a person takes one of those portions and is memorizing from it, then it's permissible for him to touch it without wudu. And the same goes for the entire Qur'an. He mentions here that if it's a small portion that one is learning from, but it also the same goes for an entire copy of the Qur'an, according to the dominant opinion, if they're learning from it. Nor is it permissible to touch a learning, sna- learning slate with, the, with Qur'an on it without wudu, unless one is a student of that very slate or a teacher who is correcting something on it. So the loh or the learning slate, which is um, a tablet made of wood where the people um, in the traditional Muslim cultures would, would write the lessons uh, from the Qur'an and all the other sciences on it and then memorize from it. That slate, the learning slate, the loh, if it has Qur'an written on it, it has the same hukum of a mushaf. So if a person is not in a state of wudu, it is prohibited for him to touch it. Unless he's a student of that very loh, or a teacher who is um, correcting a person's writing, or looking at the loh to make sure that there is um, no uh, mistakes in the recitation or the, or the, the rasm, the, the, the writing. So if a person's learning from the loh, or learning from the, um, using a copy of the Qur'an to memorize from, then, then during the learning, um, while he is learning from it, while he is studying from it, or when he is carrying it to the place of learning, or carrying it back, it's permissible for him to touch it without wudu. But once he's not studying it, once he's put it up for the day, then he has to have wudu if he wants to touch it. So if he puts his loah on, on the, uh, uh, leans it up against the wall, 
or puts his copy of the Quran on a table and he's done studying and then later on he wants to move it he would not be able to move it unless he has wudu because he is no longer learning from that particular mushaf or that particular law وَالصَّبِيُّ فِي مَسْعِ الْقُرْآنِ كَالْكَبِيرِ وَالْإِثْمُ عَلَى مُنَاوِلِهِ لَهُ The child concerning these rulings is the same as an adult and the wrong action is upon the one who enabled him to have access to it. So the sabi, the male or the female child that has not reached the age of responsibility, the age of taklif, so he's not mukallaf, for him to touch the Qur'an, the rulings are the same. He has to have wudu to touch the mushaf. If a person wants to put a copy of the Qur'an in the hands of a child, they have to have wudu unless they're a student. So if they're not a student and they do not have wudu, it's not permissible for a child to touch the Qur'an. But because there's no haram things, no prohibited things for the children, there's no sin on the child. Rather, the sin is upon the one who allowed that child to touch the Qur'an. So if a person was careless and did not put it on a high place, left it on an area where the child could get it, or actually handed it to the child and said, here, put this on the, the shelf, or here, put this back, then the sin goes to the person that allowed that child to touch the Qur'an without wudu. وَمَنْ صَلَّى بِغَيْرِ وُضُوءٌ عَامِدًا فَهُوَ كَافِرٌ وَالْعِيَاذُ بِاللَّهِ And anyone who prays intentionally without wudu is a disbeliever and we seek, we seek refuge in, with Allah. Imam Al-Aqdari has mentioned this, and the, uh, but the dominant opinion is that if a person prays without wudu, it's haram, and it makes the person a fasiq, a disobedient Muslim, but it is not kufr. It does not take that person out of uh, the folds of Islam. Because the dominant opinion of uh, the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the people of the Sunnah and the Jama'ah, is that if a person commits a wrong action, as long as he knows that it's wrong, he's not saying it's halal, then he is not out of the folds of Islam. Some scholars in the commentary of this section of Akhdari said though, what he means is that if a person prays without wudu, thinking that it's permissible to pray without wudu, then yes, he is a kafir. He is out of the folds of Islam. Because the principle is that anything that is well known to the Muslims, any of the well known obligations, if a person rejects it, then it takes him out of the folds of Islam. So are the th there are certain things, certain lessons that are known to every Muslim. The prohibition of alcohol, of adultery, of gambling, and so forth. And the obligation of fasting and praying and hajj and so forth. If somebody says that prayer is not incumbent, or doing wudu is not incumbent, or for a woman wearing hijab is not incumbent, these are things that would take them out of Islam because now they are rejecting something that's well known. It's well known from the, from the matters of the deen. So if a person does not pray, and recognizes that it's a haram, he's a fasiq for leaving the prayer. But if he says, I do not pray and it's not an obligation, then he has left Islam because now he is rejecting a lesson that was taken directly from the Qur'an. Allah has said to establish the prayer, and that order is an order of obligation. So it's as if he's rejecting something that Allah has said. Or if a woman refuses to wear hijab, and she knows that it's haram, then she's a fasiqa, she's a disobedient muslimah. But if she says it's not incumbent for me to wear the hijab, then it's as if she's rejecting the ayah in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered the women to cover themselves. A fasl fil ghusli, a section on the ritual bath or ghusl. Yajibu al ghusl min thalathati ashya al janabatu wal haydu wal nifasu. The ghusl or the full body wash is an obligation due to three things. Major ritual impurity, janaba, menstruation or hail, one nifas, postpartum bleeding. Each one of these, the author will discuss them. فالجنابة قسمان أحدهما خروج المني بلذة معتادة في نوم أو يقظة بجماع أو غيره. As for major ritual impurity, or janaba, it is of two kinds. The emission of fluid as a result of normal sexual pleasure, whether while sleeping or awake, as a result of intercourse or some other means. So for the man, the ejaculation of many, which in his case is the, is the thick whitish fluid that comes out uh, with force. And in the, the case of the woman, the many for her is a um, thin yellowish fluid that does not come out with force. So if this fluid is released, whether 
through normal sexual pleasure while uh, with normal sexual pleasure while whether while sleeping or awake sleeping such as if they in experience a dream and there's an ejaculation of fluid or awake as a result of intercourse or some other means then it is uh, then it that it puts that person in a state of janaba so he mentions as a result of normal sexual pleasure if a person does not experience normal sexual pleasure um, during the ejaculation of the fluid, then it's not considered that it puts this person in a state of janaba. So if a person has a sickness or something happens, there's a shock to his body, and this fluid is ejected, ejected then it does not put the, per, uh, put the person in a state of janaba because it's not, a no, it's not something normal. As a result of intercourse, whether it's permissible or not, or some other means, uh, whether it's permissible or not, such as for a man, masturbation, even though it's haram for him to do, if he does it and there's an ejaculation of the fluid, it puts him in a state of major ritual impurity, a state of janaba. وَالثَّانِي مَغِيبُ الْحَشَفَةِ فِي الْفَرْجِ وَمَنْ رَعَى فِي مَنَامِهِ كَأَنَّهُ يُجَامِعُ وَلَمْ يَخْرُجْ مِنْهُ مَنِيٌّ فَلَا شَيْءَ عَلَيْهِ The second thing that would cause a, a person to be in a state of major ritual impurity is the dipping of glands dipping the of the glands of the private part of, for the male of the penis into the inner folds of a woman's private part so the glands or the tip of the penis if it were to be inserted into the woman's private part even if there's no ejaculative ejaculation of fluid and even if it is only for a short period that immediately puts both the man and the female in a state of janaba which would require a full body wash Anyone who dreams that he is having intercourse during sleep and yet does not experience emission, then nothing is binding upon him. If a person, if a person sees in their dream that they're experiencing intercourse and they do experience some sort of pleasure, but there's no ejaculation of fluid, then there's, he does not have to do a full body wash for that dream. So a person does not have to think if they experience a pleasure but there's no ejaculation of fluid, that they would have to do a full body wash because of that pleasure experienced. وَمَنْ وَجَدَ فِي ثَوْبِهِ مَنِيًّا يَابِسًا لَا يَدْرِي مَتَى أَصَابَهُ أَغْتَسَلَ وَأَعَادَ مَا صَلَّى مِنْ آخِرِ نَوْمَةٍ نَامَهَا فِيهِ Should he find seminal fluid, whether dry or moist, on his clothes, and he has no idea when that came on him, he must perform a ghusl and report, repeat any prayers performed prior to that discovery since the last time since the last sleep that he had. So if a person finds, during the course of the day or the night, finds a dry uh, many on his clothes, and he does not know dry seminal fluid on his clothes, and he does not know when this happened, then he just goes back to the last time he slept, and he would perform a ghusl, and then from the last time he slept, he would repeat any prayers after it. So if he finds it, say, at Asr time, and he took a midday nap, then he would he would do a ghusl and then repeat any prayers after that midday nap. If it's now um, in mid morning duha time and he finds it on his clothes, then he knows the last time he slept was right before he woke up in the morning. So he would do a ghusl and then just repeat that the morning prayer. Fasrun faraid al ghusl al niyyatu عند الشروع والفور والدلك والعموم. The obligation of ghusl are four and they are as follows. Intention at the onset, and this intention is the same like in wudu, either he intends by this ghusl that he is removing the state of hadith, the state of impurity, spiritual impurity, or he's doing it because it's an obligation, or he's doing it to make permissible the impermissible. So he knows that for a person in a state of janaba, it's not permissible for him to recite the Qur'an. So he says, I'm doing this ghusl to to be able to recite the Qur'an. So to make this thing that was prohibited, reciting uh, Qur'an while in a state of janaba, to make that permissible. And this niyyah, just like in the wudu, and in the next section of the tayammum, and also in the prayer, the intention, whatever it says that it's an obligation, the intention, the place of intention is in the heart. And it's, rec it's disliked for a person to actually verbalize the intention. Walfawru, continuity, just like in wudu. Waddalku, rubbing the entire body. And then covering the, covering the entire body with water and making sure to follow up places uh, that could be overlooked. The back of the knees, 
the the crease where the thigh meets the hips, the, underneath the arms, um, in in the, the 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 navel, and so so forth. And if there's something hard to reach, hard for him to rub, then he can use something like a rope or assign somebody to the, do the task. So in the case of watching his back, he can use a rope to rub his back or rub it on the side of the, um, the, the, the shower room where he's washing. وَسُنَنُهُ The sunan of the ghusl غَسُلُ الْيَدَيْنِ إِلَى الْكُوْعِينِ كَالْوُضُوءِ Beginning by washing the two hands up to and including the wrists, as in wudu. وَالْمَضْمَضَةُ Rinsing the mouth. وَالْإِسْتِنْشَاقُ وَالْإِسْتِنْثَارُ Rinsing the mouth and lightly sniffing water on the nose and then lightly blowing water out of the nose. وَغَصْلُ سِمَاقِ الْأُذْنَيْنِ وَهِيَ الثُقْبَةُ الدَّاخِلَةُ فِي الرَّأْسِ وَأَمَّا صَحْفَةُ الْأُذْنِ فَيَجِبُ غَصْلُ ظَاهِرِهَا وَبَاطْنِهَا Washing the canal of the ear is a sunnah. As for the ear lobe, it, one is uh, obliged to wash the inner and the outer part. So the actual earlobe has to be washed, the outer part that can be seen, and the, uh, the inner part which is behind the earlobe, behind the ears. As for the, the ear canal, it is not an obligation to wash in it, but it is sunnah to actually wash it, and that would be by have, placing water on the, um, on the finger and then lightly washing the ear canals. A person would not pour water into the ears because that could damage, um, that could harm the health. وَفَضَائِلُهُ The virtuous acts of the ghusl are الْبِدَائِتُ بِغَصْلِ النَّجَاسَةِ ثُمَّ الذَّكَرِ فَيَنْوِي عِنْدَهُ The first thing is that he should begin by washing the impurity off his body. He would wash, for a woman, she would wash the blood uh, after menstruation or after nifas, postpartum bleeding, uh, which is the bleeding after childbirth. Or for the male or the uh, female, after um, intercourse, they would wash. Or after an ejaculation of fluid, they would wash that fluid, the many, off the body. So beginning by washing the impurity and then washing the private parts, the entire private parts. And one should make the intention at that point for mo removing the impure state or performing the sunan of the sunnah or... Um, وَفَضَائِلُهُ The virtuous acts of the ghusl are الْبِدَاعِتُ بِغَصْلِ النَّجَاسَةِ ثُمَّ الذَّكَرِ فَيَنْوِي عِنْدَهُ Beginning with the impurity and then washing the private parts and one should make an intention at that point for removing the impure state. So he begins by removing the impurity for the male that would be removing the, um, the many, the fluid that was ejaculated or for the woman after her menstrual blood or after her uh, post-childbirth bleeding the nifas that she would wash off the blood and then wash the entire private parts. And one should make an intention at that point for removing the impure state, because later on the ghusl, they're not, uh, if they come back and wash the private parts again, it would break their wudu. And he's going to mention later that the optimum thing is to perform a wudu, and then a ghusl, so that when they step out, they're able to perform, to do anything that would require a wudu. So if he did not, make the intention of removing the impure state when washing the private part. Later on in the ghusl, they're going to have to wash that area again with the intention of removing the janaba, and that would invalidate their wudu if they had it, so it wouldn't be um, uh, the optimum state for the person to be in. So he should begin by making the intention of removing the impure state from that area. ثُمَّ أَعْضَاءِ الْوُضُوءِ مَرَّةً مَرَّةً then he says it's uh, it's recommended to wash the limbs of wudu one time only. This is one opinion within the Maliki Madhab. The other opinion is that he performs a regular wudu, washing the limbs that are washed three times. Um, go ahead and go uh, going ahead and washing them three times. ثم أعلى جسده. It's also re recommended to wash the upper part of the body. So to wash, begin with the uh, with the head and then the shoulders and then go down. Um, and so a person would not start with washing their feet and then work their way up. It's also recommended to wash the head three times. Proceeding with the right side of the body first after the head. So it's also recommended to do the right side of the body and then the left side. And then the washing of the head three times is just washing the skull area where the, where the hair uh, would normally be. Washing that three times. It doesn't mean the entire head. وَمَنْ نَسِيَ لُمْعَةً أَوْ عُضْوًا مِنْ غَسْلِهِ بَادَرَ إِلَىٰ غَسْلِهِ حِينَ تَذَكُّرِهِ وَلَوْ بَعْدَ شَهْرٍ 
وأعاد ما صلى قبله وإن أخره بعد ذكره بطل غسله فإن كان في أعضاء الوضوء وصادفه, الغسل وصادفه غسل الوضوء أجزاءه Also conserving water throughout the ghusl is recommended just as conserving water within, within the wudu is recommended and there is no particular amount that a person would have to use to fulfill this recommendation. The Prophet وسلم, would use uh, a mud of, um, of, of water to do his wudu and a mud is equivalent to about half a liter of water. So to use that amount of water is is good because that's what the Prophet وسلم, used. But if he uses less or more, as long as he knows that he's conserving water in the wudu, that's recommended. In the ghusl, the Prophet وسلم, would use a sa' which is four muds. So it would equal about two liters of water. So that's how much he used. It would be good to use that amount. But if a person needs more or let or uses less, as long as he knows, he or she knows that they are conserving the water, then they fulfill the recommendation of conserving water. Should one forget a spot on his body or an entire limb, then he should immediately wash it at the time it is recalled, even if a month has elapsed. So if a person has done a complete ghusl and then later on, even after a month, he forgets or more, as long as he knows that he's conserving water in the wudu, that's recommended. In the ghusl, the Prophet ﷺ would use a sa', which is four muds, so it would equal about two liters of water. So that's how much he used. It would be good to use that amount, but if a person needs more or le- or uses less, as long as he knows, he or she knows that they are conserving the water, then they fulfill the recommendation of conserving water. Should one forget a spot on his body or an entire limb, then he should immediately wash it at the time it is recalled, even if a month has elapsed. So if a person has done a complete ghusl, and then later on, even after a month, he forgets washing um, one limb or a portion of the body, he should wash that immediately with the intention of completing this ghusl and, remo- and removing this, that state of janabah. Should he delay returning to that missed spot or limb, the entire ghusl is invalidated. So if after remembering, he delays washing that limb, and a long time passes, and that long long time is again defined by what would, would normally dry the limbs in moderate weather, if that time passes, the entire ghusl is invalidated because he has not fulfilled the continuity. If it had been one of the limbs of wudu that was missed, but it had been covered at the onset of wudu, onset when the wudu was performed, this is considered sufficient. So if he, for example, in the ghusl, he forgot to wash his arm, and then later on in the day he did a wudu and washed that limb, even if he didn't remember at the time of washing the limb that he, he, he forgot to wash this in the ghusl, as long as he had the intention in the wudu of removing the hadith, it fulfills, it completes his, his ghusl. So his ghusl is now complete. So say for example, a person got up in the morning and needed to do a ghusl. During the ghusl, they forgot to wash their right arm. And they went ahead and prayed the morning prayer with that. Later in the day, when, when dhuhr time came around, they, wa- they did wudu, washing that limb along with the other limbs of wudu. Then after that, they remembered that in the morning during the ghusl, they forgot to wash their right limb, but realized that it had been washed for the dhuhr wudu. So their ghusl is complete, they do not have to do anything, but they would have to repeat the morning prayer because it was performed with a deficient ghusl. And that's why he says, moreover, he must repeat all prayers prayed after that ghusl. Meaning, if he had prayed any prayers with that deficient ghusl, he would have to repeat them.